Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, Concert Year Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by King Newbie and my co-host, Matt Freeman. Matt, uh, how you how you feeling today? Oh, I'm feeling great. I'm ready. <coughs> <coughs> Guess I'm coming down with a little bit of a cough, but yeah, I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling great. I'm feeling feeling great. I'm ready to start a new book. It's always fun to start a new book. <laughs> Just a a good old summer cold. Nothing at all to worry yeah, about. Nothing to worry about. Yes, this week on the show, we are beginning our coverage of Stephen King's The Stand, discussing the first nine chapters of the novel. This is a big one for us, Matt. This is the final book of season two. It's the longest book we've covered so far, and I think it's the biggest book, you know, just popularity-wise we've covered so far. And that's why I think here at the very beginning of the show, uh, we just wanted to to quickly reintroduce ourselves again um, in case there is anyone listening to this show for the very first time because they said, oh, I like The Stand. People talking about The Stand. I'll listen to that. And they've never listened to uh, the rest of our series before. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. That's yeah, Scott. I'm yeah, Matt. We did that part already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Scott's the guy who's read all of the Stephen King books several times. Many times. Uh, and Scott is walking me through uh, first The Dark Tower. That was season one. And now all of the Stephen King books connected to The Dark Tower. That is season two. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so we are here at the end of our season two on The Stand. Um, I think we should say one of the big prefaces I'll, I'll put at the very beginning of this episode, if you are listening to this for the first time, is there will be Dark Tower spoilers in this. You know, the whole the whole kind of concept of the show is that we are reading these Dark Tower tangential books with the perspective of having read that main series already. So I, I don't foresee like a ton of very specific Dark Tower spoilers as we cover this book, um, just because it is, I think, one of the most tangentially related books in, in season two um, for reasons that I think you already know. Right. I think you you you, Matt, have never read this book, but, you know, most of how this relates to the Dark Tower already. I, I do. Yeah. Pop culture has informed me what this story has to do with the Dark Tower. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but, you know, Stephen King loves his themes. And I think that this book has already in these first few chapters shown that it's very much thematically connected to the dark tower in ways that we're definitely going to talk about. Yeah, definitely. So, so all that being said, if you have not read the dark tower before and you are the type of person that is really concerned about spoilers, we're not going to like put a spoiler warning before every dark tower thing. We say this at the beginning of this coverage is just going to be a blanket warning. We will be talking about the themes of the dark tower. We will be talking about some of the events of the dark tower. I'm sure throughout this thing. So just be warned about that. Um, all right. Uh, you want to you want to get right into it, Matt? Let's let's talk about The Stand. This book was originally released back in 1978. It was King's fourth novel coming after Carrie Salem's Lot and The Shining. This, of course, doesn't count uh, his Bachman book Rage, which at the time nobody knew was Stephen King. But uh, that didn't stay that way for very long. Um, it's also widely considered one of King's greatest novels, which is is an opinion I, I mostly agree with. I don't think I'd call this my favorite Stephen King book, but I think it's definitely up there for me. Um, and, and, and maybe that's the place to begin this whole conversation here, Matt, because you and I talk about writing a lot. And, and I think we talk about writing sometimes, you know, from the journeyman perspective. You know, it's a skill, it's a muscle, and it gets better as you work at it. And it's always funny to me looking at writing that – like that and then and then say an author's best work is actually one of his first you know since the stand stephen king has written like 51 novels <laughs> since this book mm -hmm. and and it's so funny to me to say that an author that that leaves this book behind and writes 50 more novels never quite achieves the greatness that this novel achieves and i don't know i mean this is complicated right because i don't i don't we're not actually saying that but it is interesting that I do consider this one of his greatest works and, and the, the complicated nature of how we talk about writing and how we talk about art. And they're not opposed, but I don't know. It's just a fun place to start, I think. Sure. I, I mean, my first thought there is that we've covered a number of directors on our Deconstructing Directors program over on the Doofcast. And it's always surprising to me how often a given director's first or maybe second film will be career defining for them and maybe considered to be their best work. 
um, you know, the matrix comes to mind as the, as just the first, first example, but I think there's, there's more than a few examples of this. Um, and I think there's all kinds of reasons why that might be the case for, for artists in general. Um, I, I, I brainstormed a few possible reasons, you know, number one is, you know, it's still, still King is early in his career, relatively speaking, but he has written several novels at this point. So he's, mm -hmm. he is, he has sharpened his skills. He's really good at writing books, but he's not so far into his career that he can just kind of go off and do really weird stuff that doesn't have that mass appeal. So this is like, uh, maybe he, he's, he's, he's developed his powers as a writer, but he's still trying to write a broadly appealing book rather than like some of the more niche stuff that he got up to later. And that's the result. The, the result is that he, he writes this book that everybody just loves. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's very possible for sure. Another possibility I thought of is, is just like maturity, like early King, you, you've pointed out had a lot more rage um, as, as uh, you know, evidenced by his writing rage um, <laughs> and maybe he mellowed later. So maybe this is just like hitting at a specific point in his development as a, human um mm -hmm. and it just reflects like what he was going through at that time like that's one thing i like to think about is sometimes there's like this perfect fit between like the subject matter and the premise and and the creator and what the creator is going through and all of that comes together and it makes a piece of art that just it it couldn't have been made any better by any other person you know yeah um, yeah just serendipity yeah, I think that's kind of where I land on this whole thing. I, you know, I, I love talking about the the skill and the technique of writing and and how a writer, you know, does things to accomplish their goals. But at the same time, sometimes art is art, right? And sometimes this this combination of technique and skill comes together with I don't know God given natural talent, whatever. Um, with you know being right place at the right time in your life and the life of the world to just create something that no one else could have done at and was done at the exact right time in someone's career was done at the exact right time and in, in the everything and that just becomes this this masterpiece and I, and I do think that's what happened here I mean like if we if we sat down and like actually like a line by line like examined King's writing could we say that you know 50 years later he's maybe gotten a little bit better at turning a phrase possibly right a, a little bit better at the at the individual techniques of constructing a story maybe but this is a book that i think is just it, it goes beyond all those little techniques it, it is it is ambitious it is assured it is uh it is crazy in a lot of ways i mean it, it, it's kind of crazy that he wrote this book it, it's it's a huge massive book and i and we're going to talk in a bit that when it was published, it was not quite as big as as the version we're reading, but but still, it, it's it's this incredibly ambitious project um, that a very young writer who you know has has hit it big by this point, you know he's he's very popular, but not like not, obviously not like I can do whatever I want popular. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. There's just there's just something about it. There's something there's something. And, and I think one of the main, my main goals of this next 15 weeks is going to be to put words to this, this almost ineffable, ineffable something that mm -hmm. I feel when I when I read this book. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I've only read, obviously, the first few chapters, but I kind of feel what you mean. I've read a lot of King at this point. I think it's fair to say not as much as you, obviously, but I think objectively a lot. And uh, there's, there's just something about this book, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's funny. It's funny. Cause part of me is worried. Like what if it just doesn't quite live up to how, how this has been built up for me as just like, Oh, I can't wait till we get to the stand. Um, and I'm just loving the hell out of it. I'm not really surprised because like, I know Stephen King and he's, he's great, <laughs> but also it's like, yeah, it really, it really does. There is something special there. That makes me happy to hear because yeah, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little concerned that like I and our community of listeners and just the planet earth have spent your entire life kind of slowly building this thing up for you. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's so, to me, it's so refreshing to dive into it and be like, I just feel like I'm home again. And I feel like everything I've thought about this book just immediately becomes self-evident as yes, this is, this is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we are going to be reading 
the complete and uncut version of The Stand, which was released 12 years after its initial publication in the year 1990. As we mentioned briefly last week, this edition adds back like 350, 400 pages to the novel that King originally cut due to the demands of his publisher, um, who said, it's a pain in the ass to bind and print and publish a book of that size, and it will hurt your sales. And they might have been right, you know, like at, at that point in his career, People might not have put up with that, but uh, obviously 12 years later, he got to a point of his career that he said, fuck you, I, I do what I want and, and released this giant mammoth book. You think that uh, if this had been published, you know, in later history, um, maybe it would have just been published as a series? It might have been. Yeah, um, I feel like series, especially in this in this like post-apocalyptic world are are much more popular these days than they than they were back then. So yeah, maybe. I- I can think of relatively few series, you know, back then, you know, like we think about, we think about Lord of the Rings, but that was only published as a series because it was too big to be published yeah. as a book, you know, kind of the same thing that happened with this book. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, you know, King, I think wrote this book with Lord of the Rings in mind, you know, we've, we've talked Dark Tower about Lord of the Rings quite a bit, but I think this was, you know, before the Dark Tower, this was him saying, this is my version of Lord of the Rings. Um, in a different in a different lens, I think he's obviously King really likes Tolkien and likes Lord of the Rings, and I think he's especially young in his career, like perpetually trying to do his own version of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's that's fun. So we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk about Lord of the Rings, as always. As always. Um, so I, I, we're not going to, as we go through the, the novel, we're not going to point out every instance of a change from one to another, I think, because a, a, there's a lot of them and there, some of them are just small wording changes and things like that. I think we will point out like the big, big items. There are entire scenes that were completely added back. Um, but one of the big things I did want to point out here at the beginning of the book is I think one of the biggest changes that King made here. Um, the Stand, as we said, was written in 1978, took place in the year 1980, um, or at least that's that's when the book begins in the year 1980 when the paperback came out uh he pushed that date forward and he said actually the book takes place in the year 1985 and then here finally when the 1990 complete and unedited version of the book comes out he sets the book in that year he sets the book in 1990 so as you were reading this book you noticed that this book took place in 1990 Uh, that wasn't the case originally and what it means is All the pop culture references that King peppers through this book, which is a thing that he does in all of his novels, he's always been very specific with his pop culture stuff, Uh, that all had to be uh, brought forward and changed to be what would be appropriate to the characters and to, you know, the audience in the year 1990, which is just a really interesting choice that I think is worth talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think this fact really highlights how much King thinks about pop culture. It's not just like it's some silly tick of his that he puts, you know, references to Coca-Cola instead of soda into his books. Like he's actually thinking about it. He's thinking about the references as part of his craft, as part of the piece of the art that he's making. He's using these details to ground you and make the world feel real to you. And it's important to him. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I didn't I didn't know that he that he went back and he edited um, the book to be, you know, more of the moment. But you telling me that I'm like, wow, that really kind of I, I don't know. I guess I knew that he did this thing, but this is just such a, a bullet in the idea that like, yeah, he he definitely thinks about this a lot. Yeah. And, and to me, it speaks to this real desire in him to want this particular story to be current for the people reading it. Mm-hmm. Like he wants like he originally set the book two years in the future, right? When the book came out, it was 1978. He wanted it to be the year 1980. He wanted people to be reading this book and seeing this as, a, as an event that happens in the future. He did it again when the paper book comes out. And then I think when, when the uncut edition comes out, he sets it in that exact year, but he doesn't want it to be something that people are reading about that happened in the past. I think he wants people to be thinking about the events of this book as something that is happening right now. And of course, that's not the case for us because this takes place in 1990. The world is very different from 1990. But it is, I mean, we have to mention it is rather fascinating to be reading this book at the at the tail end, I guess we'll call it, of the the COVID pandemic, right? Obviously not nearly as deadly as as Captain Trips, but still something that we lived through that makes this book timely for us, even even if the pop culture references in it are not uh not mm-hmm. up to date. 
Yeah, th- this is one comment. I, I don't know if there's any better place to make it, but I'll just make it up front. Uh, you know, we read uh, a book called Station Eleven for Book Club recently, mm-hmm. um, which is also about a pandemic. And um, overall, I like that book. But one of my uh, mild complaints w- was like, this person failed to adequately express how stupid um, people are <laughs> and how stupid our response to a pandemic would be. Uh, and I think this is a general failure of fiction is, is often um, a failure to imagine how stupid things will actually go. Um, yeah. Now, the funny thing is we're not that far into this book, but I'm already appreciating how everything is going wrong in, in very stupid human ways in a way that it's like, yeah, I mean, it's these are this is a theme that King is doing. Yeah. Um, but also it happens to be more correct in a predictive sense, like we our our pandemic wasn't as deadly as this one but in terms of the way people behaved in terms of the way the authorities behaved i'm i'm already feeling like this is going to be more more accurate in some sense uh, yeah, yeah i think you're so right you know i think it, pe- a lot of people called this book prescient while the covid-19 pandemic was happening and i, I don't think it was because the, to the sheer number of people were dying and the, and the wiping out of entire populations, but very much so because you look at King's view on the government response and on how people deal with this thing. I think you're totally right there. Um, it's definitely one of the most important themes of the book that we can we can tell that already very early. And yeah, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was really fucking stupid. And this is also a very, a very, a very stupid pandemic in this thing. Yeah. The, the reason this happens is just dumb. It's just dumb. Yeah. And it's infuriating that it is that. Dumb. Right. We'll talk about the details as we go. But yeah. 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 So The Stand, the book, begins with several quotes, as King books already do. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on these, but the, the first three quotes that we are met with as we open this book are from Bruce Springsteen, from Blue Oyster, Oyster Cult, and lasty from Country Joe and the Fish. All of these lyrics center on death. The, the Springsteen song is, is one called Jungerland. Blue Oyster Cults, of course, is their probably most well-known Don't Fear the Reaper. But the most interesting one to me Matt, and I mean interesting because I I didn't know what it was talking about, is the quote from Country Joe and the Fish, because the only quote we see here is, what's that spell? What's that spell? What's that spell? And if you were like me, you were probably like, what are they talking about? <laughs> um, so I did a little research and, and I learned that uh, the band Country Joe and the Fish had a song called I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die. Um, which is, again, very very fitting for the book we're reading. But at the very beginning of that song, they do this kind of typical call and response cheer that you hear at, at uh, sports games all the time. So, you know, like, give me an F, give me a U, give me a C, give me a K. Uh, and they say, what's that spell? And they say the F word, Matt. <gasps> I, can't, I can't say it because someone got mad at us for saying it the F word, but You're right. to say that bad, bad word. Yeah, um, we, we, we don't say that word any, anymore. No, no. Uh, so the song itself, though, is is a Vietnam protest song, um, and I just I just think it's really interesting. You know, the, the Blue Oyster Cult relation is, I think, very obvious. The Springsteen song is, is a song that has is talking about death, is talking about you know, kind of not also like the Blue Oyster Cult song, like not being afraid of death, just living your life. Um, and then we have this one, right? Which, if you research it, you see how death works into it. This is a protest song. Uh, about Vietnam and about the the death that was happening in Vietnam, but just the the quote that we see in the book doesn't really cue you into that at all. Yeah, I um may, maybe the people who were uh, reading the book when it came out would have understood this reference without it having to be explained to them. And, and I think it, they might have. Yeah, yeah. I think it might have landed as like a great joke, um, uh, but not not so much for us anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, though, because like like we said, this book was aged up to 1990, but the book very much feels like a a, a recently post Vietnam um, anger and mistrust and frustration with the government story. You know, um, that that mm, King, yeah. I think King started working on this book in 1975. He didn't finish it until a little bit before 1978, which is when it was published. Um, it, it, it has that feeling to me. And that is a thing that doesn't i guess it sort of ages up to 1990 as well but it, i think it was much more prevalent in the population probably when this when this book came out yeah i mean that's certainly the overall 
vibe. I agree. It, it's a it's a very particular feeling. You know, it's hard to put your mm. finger on it exactly. Yeah, it's just yeah. there's there's something about you know there were there there's there's like uh, you know there's like a third more people in the United States now than there were in 1975. So it's just That's a very wild. different feeling country. That's wild to think about. I mean, I know you're right, but like. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I let me let, let me rephrase that. There's half again. There's <laughs> how, the, how the hell do you s- express this? There's 150 <laughs> percent as many people now than there were in 1975. Um, so the point is, it, it it just feels very different as a country for all sorts of reasons than it used to feel, and it's kind of interesting how that comes across in the page, um, um, in ways that don't actually have to do with like you know, the brand of, of whatever soda people are drinking. It's just, it's just the way the country is. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe we can pay attention to point out some of these things as we go, if we, if we can notice them. Sure. I, I mean, and one of the, the most interesting things to me is like, if you're reading this book in the nineties, I mean, which is not to say like people, people in the nineties were totally on board with the government again, and were totally trusting and then loved it. You know, I don't necessarily think that's what I'm saying here, but I do think that like the predominant, mood of the 60s and 70s was very much fuck the government they suck we hate them that kind of shifted away as we moved through the 80s into the 90s right um so like a person reading this book in the 90s i think wouldn't take that same stuff quite as as hard as a person reading it when it came out and again this is one of those things where it becomes prescient for us because we are on the back of this pandemic like reading this stuff going yeah the government is fucking dumb they totally yeah. would fuck this whole thing up <laughs> but yeah like like it's just like it, it it means so much more to us today than perhaps it did it would have in the 90s and and so it's like kind of we've kind of come full circle back to the what the original audience might have felt as they were reading this in 1978 yeah no that's a good point that the the feelings toward the government kind of i think the feelings toward the economy too mm-hmm. because yeah yeah like you like you say like like 1990 man um the country was doing really well economically relative to you know 19 1980 or the, the end of the 70s yeah and, yeah and now once again we're entering a recession so it's just it's feeling more of the moment that's an interesting point yeah yeah I like that all right so let's actually begin the book huh <laughs> we're yeah, sure. 25 minutes into this thing let's let's talk about the stand so the book begins kind of ominously with the phrase the circle opens we don't really know much what to do with that yet but uh, then we move into a sort of prologue although it's not really marked as a prologue um, and in this prologue we are immediately met with charlie campion our patient zero uh, a military police officer responsible for guarding the base in which the captain trips virus unfortunately makes its escape at the beginning of the novel we find out that campion has fled the base after the red light went on and now is frantically packing up his wife and child to run away across the country god damn it campion yeah yeah i mean he's just being a scared human right right that's 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 uh the most stephen king thing of all isn't it that Mm -hmm. that the the banality of evil stems from people acting out of fear yeah definitely that's uh exactly what this is right even as he's doing it you have a hard time really i mean no let's be honest we can blame him but yeah you feel like in his position you might make the same choice yeah, I mean, like you're, you're terrified, and your wife and kid are at home. What are you gonna do? Just say, "Well, I'm dead." Bye. And, and he I, doesn't I, know, you know, he he doesn't know that he caught it yet, right? He's right, he's right. he's dumb. He's he's kind of panicking. He's just hoping, like, let's just get away from here, right? He doesn't realize yeah. really what has happened exactly. Well, and it makes you wonder how much was he even aware of of the full scope mm. of what they were even doing in there? Because if he's just an MP, like, are they gonna fill him in on the details of? project blue probably not so he knows a red light came on and that's bad he knows the door was supposed to shut and it didn't and that was bad but does he know that there's an extremely contagious extremely deadly virus that's floating through the air right now that he could possibly have maybe not maybe not yeah good point it it always fascinates me though to think about reading this book for the first time you know like not knowing that it was about a pandemic that is gonna wipe out the entire population like what must it have been like to pick up this novel and not know that at first and one of the the things i tried to do as i was reading this prologue is kind of think of that and think of what that experience would have been like because like we have campion here talking about red lights and and worried about which way the wind is blowing and everyone being dead which i guess answers our previous question that he seems to 
at least know it's an airborne uh, pandemic, right? Um, Because he's worried about wind blowing and stuff. I guess. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, sure. Maybe you could have thought it was radiation or something. Who knows? Sure, sure, sure. Um, And think about like what what, what a person in 1978, like how, how quickly into this book would they have been like, oh, Oh, it's a it's a pandemic. That's what we're doing here. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, were epidemics and pandemics like on people's minds in the late seventies? I, I know they are for us right now, but I, I I don't know. I don't know if that was like a, a a hot button concern in culture at the time. Yeah, all I can think of re- re- uh, relative to that is Michael Crichton's Andromeda Strain came out in nineteen sixty nine. Um, wow, and, and the movie came out. Ago? Yeah. It, it's funny to think of when when Crichton's career actually was. It's always shifted earlier than I realized. But yeah, uh, and and then the Andromeda Strain movie came out in like seventy two or so. So it's highly possible that King, you know, saw that movie and or read that book, was kicking around the ideas. Not that that's about a pandemic per se, but it's about a, a virus. Yeah, I thought there was another virus book, but but I I don't know. I don't actually know. Um, I couldn't think of it. Like, I, I, I mean, I know there have been obviously, but that, but I, I think they were more recent. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember. I, I feel like there was a big like pandemic thing in the '90s. Actually, like, I remember the movie Outbreak. There was Outbreak. There was like there was a book called like The Hot Zone. Yeah. Um, people were were really obsessed with Ebola in the '90s. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's funny because like I I distinctly remember the like Ebola panic, but that was way after you know, King wrote this book. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he started a trend here. Maybe. So one other thing to mention about, uh, I was just wondering, like the name Campion is, is a pretty unusual name, right? Um, I haven't, I hadn't heard the word, the name Campion like ever. And other than this book and the character in uh, raised by wolves, the sadly canceled HBO TV show. No, the one that wasn't that, the that one good. that was amazing. Um, <laughs> And so Campions are kind of flower. Mm -hmm. And there was also a guy named Campion who was a uh, a Catholic Jesuit priest who was martyred. That's all I got. Uh, I'm just, I'm the reason I bring this up is I'm like, is there some reference? Is there some literary reference to a Campion that, that would be appropriate for like the guy who is responsible for carrying the deadly virus, you know? Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, whenever I hear Campion, I think of Jane Campion, the the film director uh, who Mm -hmm. directed the piano, but I think her, she was not active at the time King would have been writing this book. So I don't think it's a reference to that and I don't see how it would be, but uh, so that's kind of colored my, my view on the name. So I can't, I, I just hear her when I think of, campion so i don't know yeah i only bring it up because normally king names are like john and freddie yeah. you know not it's just a really unusual name so sure sure yeah i think one of the most important things to to point out here at the beginning though we've kind of already talked about this but i'll, I'll hit this point again before we even know what captain trips is and how it was made the book wants us to understand that it got out due to a mistake, a malfunction, right? That, that, that the red light went on and the door was supposed to close and seal immediately. And it didn't. And it gave Campion just enough time to slip out past that airtight door. And then he, there were supposed to be guards on duty at the edge of the facility. And those guards were not there. And so he just walked out. Uh, and it seems important that this is the first thing we learn about this whole thing, that, that the first frame of reference on this whole thing is not the United States government developed a super virus. It is s- stupid, dumb mistakes happened. And that's how this whole thing starts. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just basic incompetence and and fuck uppery. So, so like maybe this is my personal bias based on my working life as an engineer. But <laughs> in my experience, if you, you know, drop your finger randomly on a blueprint and it turns out that, that your finger has landed on a serious mistake or, if, you know, if you observe some kind of system failure of, of the nature of like two fail safes fail to prevent the viral release at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. This doesn't mean that you're incredibly unlucky. This doesn't mean that some astronomical coincidence has occurred. This implies that the thing you're looking at is riddled with serious mistakes at multiple levels, and failure was inevitable. Actually, uh, mm. so so like yeah, it's not it's not two unlucky flukes. It's 
this was almost an inevitable outcome of of their stupid ass uh, uh, <laughs> re research program that was just woefully inadequate to the task. I like that. I like that a lot. That's great. And this prologue ends with the ominous sentence, by dawn, they were running east across Nevada and Charlie was coughing steadily, uh, which is just perfect, right? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Bad news. Bad news. We then move on to book one of The Stand, which is titled Captain Trips, which we learn this week, actually, will be what the superflu ends up being called. Interestingly enough, we just learned that in passing, we don't actually see that it's named that yet and, and are not given a reason for why it's called that at all. But uh, but that's what we're told. So we, we believe it. Yeah, that is, that's funny. We also see more song quotes here at the very beginning of this particular book. One of them is from the Silvers. It's a title, it's a it's a uh, a song called Boogie Fever. And the other song is kind of hilariously from Larry Underwood, a character from this book, singing his hit single, Baby Can You Dig Your Man. We'll talk about the song a little bit more later, but this is kind of hilarious, right? Like King has throughout the course of this book established every single one of these quotes is a real quote from a real song and then he just does this one and if you're reading this book for the first time you're like huh i never heard of that one and it's because it doesn't actually exist because it's a character from this very book you're reading and you haven't even met him yet that's hilarious yeah i, I like it i think it pulls you into the story and like we were talking about earlier with the pop culture stuff it's like he inserts real world pop culture stuff into the book and then he muddles it with a, a sort of pop culture confabulation that he's invented mm -hmm. within the book and it 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 i don't know it's a fun kind of judo throw to muddle your own reality with the reality of the book and maybe on some subconscious level you you the book feels more real to you now yeah no totally all right so let's begin with chapter one the book proper begins in a little town called arnett texas at bill hapscom's texaco station and here I think Matt is where Stephen King's essential, let's call it kinginess, already starts to shine through in this book, right? What the first part of this book, what book one in general and this chapter specifically excels at to me is so effortlessly constructing this complete world into which Captain Trips comes crashing. And like we just come here, we just come upon the scene and it's just a group of men all sitting around outside a gas station. They're talking shit to each other. The first page of this novel is about Hap and the, and the rest of his boys discussing money printing and inflation and, and all the problems of the day as they talk about these things. Um, we, we kind of learn that they all work in this very small town, small Texas town used to have two factories. One of the factories is closed down. The other is kind of limping along. And so they're just, dudes shooting the shit about their problems and they're remarkably quickly characterized they feel real they feel like whole immediately it's just remarkable to me how quick he can do this yeah no it's becoming uncanny with the the discussion of uh, inflation um being being very relevant at the moment <laughs> yeah. um but yeah I, I agree that the magic of king is always his ability to give each and every character each and every one of these guys sitting around shooting the shit a personality uh it's, some of them we'll see again some of them we won't you can never tell because they're all so well drawn and three-dimensional yeah. and and just unique and you know it feels like you're stepping into a real event that you're watching unfold it's not a story it's these guys are just hanging out and then they saw a car come cruising in and so on yeah, I, well said. I wonder how long it took you to actually realize that like Stu Redman was a an actual character in the story and not just one of the handful of dudes from this beginning that, that we're, we're meeting right before things go to shit. Well, Stu, I think, is one name that I actually had heard. Oh, but see, cheater, cheater. But that does but see like <laughs> that. Like overall, your, your question is is well taken regardless, because like. I maybe one of these other guys is also going to make it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, like you could tell me, yeah, they do. Or you could tell me, no, Sue's the only one. And I, I equally in either case, believe you because like I said, they're all so well drawn. I think that that also helps like in some sense, you know, or at least I know have, you know, since I know what the book is generally about that, like almost everybody in the world is going to die. And thus, as you're meeting characters, you're like, okay, are we meeting a character who's going to be a main character, a central character who continues on through the story? 
or are we just going to see this person for five pages and then they're going to die? And it's really hard to tell. Um, really, really hard to tell. I think Stu, it's just like, like certain characters, because you get their point of view, you're like, okay, this is probably somebody we're going to ride along with for a while. Sure. But um, almost anybody who doesn't get a, and even some people who do get a point of view, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure are not going to make it very long. So yeah, that makes I, it fun. I, I mean, I think you can maybe guess here that Stu gets the most detailed backstory of, of all the, the men at this station. So maybe he is, the book is declaring him as slightly more important, but I think you're right that this tendency of King to fill in backstory for all his characters, regardless of how important, like we talked about this many times throughout the show that there's a character that like is a taxi driver that drives our characters for four pages and King will spend three of those four pages telling us this man's life story before we never see him again. And it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are some of our favorite parts of these books, but what it does here in a, in a book where you know that, 99% of these people are going to die. You're kind of always uncertain. And I, I think that's a, I think that's what he wants you to feel. And I, it works wonderfully. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of Stu Redman, let's meet him. Uh, we meet Stu, who is a poor boy who grew up here in Arnett, Texas. We learned that he almost got out. He was so close to getting out, but then his mom got sick um, and he had to drop out of his plans for college and, and take a job here and has kind of spent his life here in Arnett. Um, one of the things I love about early King, and, and I don't mean this as like a dig on modern King, who I obviously still very much love, but this book, he's still like less than a decade removed from being like super, super poor, <laughs> like mm -hmm. incredibly poor, like barely meeting ends meet. Um, and I think, you know, to, to be fair to him, I don't think that's a thing you fully ever truly forget when you are that desperate. Um, but he also has lived the majority of his life now being like incredibly rich. So like he has these memories of being poor and these memories of living in desperation. Um, but they are just that they are memories. And I think like this book, when he writes about the desperation of Stu, when he writes about Stu lying to get a factory job work at, at, at 14 because his family needed it, uh, needed the money when he, when he writes about the, how desperate and concerned and terrified they were at all time. Like I, th I think you feel it just a little bit more. It, it's not a distant memory for King. It's like a real world thing that he's still kind of actively processing in a lot of ways. Um, and, and that's not fair to him because like, course you, you you get money you're gonna change over time like that's i'm not it's like a, it's not a dig at his current writing but i don't know there's something about this that just like immediately hits you the 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 urgency of it to me yeah that's a good point maybe it is it is a bit more autobiographical perhaps i i i will say that Stu feels very different from any other king um central character i was gonna say protagonist but i i don't actually know who the protagonist is or if there's <laughs> gonna be one protagonist sure, sure um but yeah i mean it's clear he's gonna be important and he's just extremely fresh and different and distinct and i can't really uh, if i try to line him up against any of the other kind of central male lead characters it's it feels it feels really different and that's that's good right like especially if you're gonna have a big ensemble um, um, you know, cast of characters, you want them to all feel very different and, and distinct from each other. And yeah. so um, the fact you feel he feels very different from everyone else in the book and from any other King character that I can think of. Yeah, I think you're right, especially, you know, the, the, the former thing you said there that he feels very different from every character in the book. We're, we're going to meet four characters this week, right? We meet Stu, we're going to meet Franny, we're going to meet Larry, and at the very end, we're going to meet Nick. Um, and it is really fascinating to me when you really sit down and study the text, how different the prose feels from point of view to point of view. Um, and I think the one that sticks out to me the most with that is Franny, which we'll talk about here in a bit. But her her internalization feels very distinct and different from everyone else to me. And and that that I think it, that's that's a sign of a you know a confident writer who like not only am I going to make a book with a, a giant list and cast of characters but i'm also going to put in the work to characterize them differently and make them feel different when we are in their head so that's that's mm -hmm. encouraging to hear you say that that's great yeah it's awesome 
Um, so Stu, we, we learn here, has had a, a little bit of a, a rough life and it, it hasn't gotten much better. Um, he's working part time at the, the one remaining factory, a calculator manufacturing company in town, um, only getting, I think, 30 hours a week. So he's not even full time. Um, we also learn that he lost his wife to cancer four years earlier. I think we specifically are told this is like uterine cancer, um, which I think will play into some stuff we're going to talk about a little bit later. But um He's kind of, I think we see a man in a rut here. Like he, he had these great dreams of getting out of this town and then events happened and that kept him here. And now all those events are gone, right? His mother is dead. Uh, his wife is dead. There's nothing keeping him here except for, you know, himself that like, except for, except for the, the urge to change. And I think change is one of the big themes that we're going to be seeing, especially this week. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, you, you you almost want to say Stu is is depressed or that he would be depressed if it wasn't sort of against his innate nature to be because he doesn't seem depressed, but it's like based on the way he's living his life, he he is in a rut as you say. He's beat down by life, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's right. And to this picturesque scene we suddenly see a car driving erratically approaching the grass gas station i love the little detail here one of the things i I paid a lot of attention to on this reread is the ways in which king uses events to characterize characters and and so we know Stu's backstory but like who is he as a person and i think the book does a really good job of answering that because Stu is the first one to see the car coming he is the first one to like speak about it he says something very quickly and and obviously better shut off your pumps hap and then of course he's the one that actually does it right he says it to to hapscom but he takes too long to do it so he just stands up and he shuts the pumps off himself so we're we're we're, we're doing the work to define Stu as the guy who's maybe a little bit more observant than the people around him is more quick to act act like just you know a a, a leader i guess we could say in in some ways yeah yeah absolutely um I mean, I know I overuse the word at this point, but there are certain traits that just say gunslinger, and mm, yeah, um, yeah, and and I think you know, the, the, the certainly certainly the, the ability to act in the moment is one of those traits. Yeah. I, I love the emphasis on the idea that like he misses see like seeing the actual collision of the car with the pumps because he is t- turning off the pump, he's turning off the switches, while everyone else is just like staring helplessly, slack jawed at the collision doing nothing he's actually doing something and, and thus he misses actually seeing it i thought that was a very interesting kind of poetic moment yeah no i like that a lot that's great so in this car we find what remains of our friend from the prologue campion and his family and i think here we get the first look at what captain trips actually does to you um and it's uh horrifying matt <laughs> mm. uh, it says here leaning against her was a boy or girl about three years old They were both dead. Their necks had swelled up like inner tubes, and the flesh there was purple-black color, like a bruise. The flesh was puffed up under the eyes, too. They looked, Vic later said, like those baseball players who put lamp black under their eyes to cut the glare. Their eyes bulged sightlessly. The woman was holding the child's hand. Thick mucus had run from their noses and was now clotted there. Flies buzzed around them, lighting the mucus, crawling in and out of their open mouths. Stu had been in the war, but he had never seen anything so terribly pitiful as this. His eyes were constantly drawn back, back to those linked hands. So what do you think of uh, the super flu, Matt? It's pretty pretty great, huh? Yeah, it's it's very um, – I guess this is one thing that that I didn't know or that, that kind of surprised me. You know, I, I, And I, I'll have to admit there's going to be some amount of us while we're reading this, me being like – and I had no idea about this because I feel like I know <laughs> – so much through osmosis Um, but yeah i didn't know that the actual effects of the virus were like horrifying and and Mm -hmm. grotesque and disgusting um even the symptoms that the people have when they're alive seem to be pretty disgusting yeah um just like objectively like 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 viscerally disgusting in a way where it's like you can imagine like mucus and and coughing and phlegm and all these words where you're just like yeah um and uh yeah and King knows that and he's playing that up, I think. Yeah, the, the choice to make their necks all swollen and gross um, is the most interesting one to me because that's so specific and, and disturbing. I kind of I kind of love it. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I think it's worth pointing out here. That, like this is one of those those uh, results of aging up the book to 1990 because 
here we have Stu had been in the war, but he had never seen anything so terribly pitiful as this. What, what <laughs> war? <laughs> Cause I think when the book was written, obviously Vietnam, right? Yeah. Like obviously, but desert storm. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it was still too early for Desert Storm, right? I, I, I don't even remember, Scott. I'm, I think I'm it sorry. was. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm 100 sure that you're right. It was too early, um, but uh, no, you're right. I, I, I think in my brain, this is just actually happening in the the vague, indistinct period between 70 and 90, because I was only barely born <laughs> during part of that, anyway. So sure, sure. Um, or it's just happening on another level of the tower in which there was a giant war in the 80s. Yeah, or, or Vietnam happened in the 80s. There you go. Or I Vietnam mean, we do, just kept happening. We do know from the Dark Tower that the, the version of the world that, that uh, was wiped out to Captain Trips there is one that had a different Kansas City baseball team and had a whole different type of cola can, right? Mm. So it's a different world. That's true. Are or there references it? to the cola can? We'll in, see. The, in the stand? Yeah. Um, nah, nah, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so we learned that Campion is still alive, but barely. Uh, w- what I love about the pros here, though, Matt, is everywhere around people infected with Captain Trips, it, th- there's this thing like King knows at this point that you know, and he's having a lot of fun with it. Before he you know with chapter eight takes a whole chapter kind of showing us how the virus is spread he just kind of likes to write about it and wink at it right like he has fun people putting he has a lot of this fun putting people in close contact situations like when you see hap climb into the back of the ambulance with dying campion you're like oh no not don't go not in there mm-hmm. um yeah he just has a lot of fun with this throughout this early part of the book yeah, absolutely. There's so many little mentions throughout this whole week's reading of people just coughing or sneezing briefly. And it just, yeah. even if you're caught up in some other thing that's happening in the story, you're being reminded of, of what's going on in the background. Definitely. definitely. So from here, we move on to chapter two, uh, which will introduce us to 22 year old Franny Goldsmith from Algonquit, Maine. Since Franny is uh, so far removed from the superflu events down in Texas, this is kind of the book declaring her a main character, right? I, I think you probably picked up on that immediately when we cut all the way from texas up to maine with just a character chilling there um kind of signposting important character here well especially just the way she jumps off the page yeah i mean yeah you you use the word assured earlier when describing this book and and i think franny is the most assured creation the most solid creation of kings that i can readily recall or or, you know at at least she's up there with the likes of eddie and roland in Mm -hmm. terms of just rapidly jumping off the page being like a a person that i feel like i know not just a character in a book um and this again in in a relatively short number of pages yeah i totally agree i i love franny goldsmith so much i think king can be very hit or miss with some of his female characters at times and i mean that in the full the, the real sense of the word that sometimes they're absolute hits and sometimes they just don't quite work um i think franny is is one of the good ones for sure mm-hmm. uh, she's she's wonderful i love her so much yeah, yeah. um and, and as i was talking about earlier we kind of immediately see franny as this incredibly introspective person like a lot of her chapter is filled with her kind of thinking out stuff to herself and processing stuff to herself in a way that I don't think we have we saw from Stu and, and we definitely don't see from Nick. Um, she she's just kind of in her head quite a bit, right? Um, and yeah. and I love how this this version of her head is very she's like bitter and biting and sarcastic and I don't know I just there's a lot there's a lot to love in that head. She's she's bitter and sarcastic, but not to the point where she becomes self pitying and therefore unlikable. Yeah, it's no, really totally. interesting how he rides that line, actually. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. So we learn here that Franny is pregnant and she's here to tell her 21 year old boyfriend about it. And I, I love this moment where she looks out at him, like sitting there waiting at the dock. And it's this beautiful, like New England picturesque moment and and kind of, you know, angry, bitter and sarcastic Franny sees this and decides that he's doing this on purpose, right? I I love the text here. The silhouette at the far end of the pier was still tossing small rocks into the water. Her thought was partly amusing, but mostly dismaying. He knows what he looks like out there, she thought. Lord Byron, lonely but unafraid, sitting in lonely solitude and surveying the sea, which leads back, back to where England lies. But I, in exile, may never... 
oh balls <laughs> she says as she realizes that she's being mean to him for no reason i i uh oh, there's it's so much to love in this writing here matt i love it yeah well it's it, it's it's hilarious right because she's yeah. basically saying that like he's a complete poser yeah. who almost like the reason he's sitting out there at the far end of the pier tossing rocks is to portray this image of being this artiste this the sensitive soul um and she gets it right and and like She's kind of at war with herself over like how to feel about all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just great. Yeah. And she I think she's trying to really hard to convince herself that she loves him. Right. Mm-hmm, that she, mm-hmm. she wants to love him because that would solve a problem of what to do about this baby is, oh, we are in love with each other. We have a baby now. Let's get married and that'll all work. But I think she knows she doesn't. And so like her her intrusive thoughts keep like painting him in this very negative light which is truly the way she feels about him but she's actively trying to push that stuff away because she that that complicates things more than she wants it, them to yeah exactly yep i love this entire scene though i love their entire interaction this, this there's this part where franny goes to kind of sneak up behind jess and legitimately just scares the shit out of him doing so and then in response he kind of steps towards her causing her to trip and fall on her butt and and she ends up biting the shit out of her tongue like so bad that it bleeds for a while and so we have this very clear image of this bleeding tongue coming from franny um throughout the rest of the scene i I just love the construction of this so much me too yeah especially like you said the bit where he steps aggressively toward her yeah This, this, this note of of underlying you know violence I I, th- I mean honestly I think we I think I know the direction we're going with this character like he's 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 a a person with a capacity for violence and a lot of a lot of badness that mm-hmm. is being hidden by his uh, you know soft exterior and uh, I I, uh, I shouldn't say I know where we're going there's all sorts of directions we should go but um, I don't think we're going to end up feeling that Jess is a cool guy yeah I I think it's really interesting to me how King kind of slow rolls this character, because I think, you know, you kind of start off the conversation with her being kind of sarcastic and coming off a little rude to him. Maybe like she's, she's upset and she, I mean, she's going through a lot, right. And she's upset about it and she's mad at herself. She's mad at him. She's mad about the whole thing. And so she's being like very aggressive towards him. And he's kind of like, trying to process the information and so you might like initially be a little bit more sympathetic to him but then the longer the conversation goes on i think the more that sympathy if if it ever existed and and you just completely drains out and you're like oh this guy's actually just real shitty actually yes yes definitely um but you know not not cartoonishly so but yes yeah yeah (laughs) this is part that i really wanted to point out here though um Jess asks her, how did it happen? I thought you were on the pill. Well, what I figure is, one, somebody in the quality control department of the jolly old overall factory was asleep at the switch when my batch of pills went by on the conveyor belt. Or two, they are feeding you boys something in the UNH mess hole that builds up sperm. Or three, I forgot to take the pill and have since forgotten that I forgot. So that's a really funny exchange and and is really great for Franny's personality and defining of Franny's personality. But my favorite part of it is we actually saw her go through each one of these options in her head before she says it out loud to Jess. And I love that. Like it's so character defining to have this moment where she reasons something in her head and then basically repeats the same thing verbatim via dialogue. Like it shows that she is incredibly in her own head, but that she is going to actually speak her mind when it comes to these things. Um, I I just, I love that little detail. I agree. And it it makes her, likable that she's willing to say you know that that last option yeah i mean i i I don't think i forgot to take the pill but it's always possible that that's something that that she didn't necessarily have to volunteer right yeah Uh, but you know there's no defensiveness there's no excuse making even though you can tell that she understands the gravity of the situation yeah um she comes across as thoughtful and responsible and uh really likable and great yeah, I mean, she's she's definitely very emotional and, and frustrated, but yeah, I think you're right that she's trying to find solutions to the problem, and she's trying to be very matter-of-factly about what her options are, what their options are at this point, and he's not responding very well with that. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting because she is being she is emotional, but what you what you see her doing is trying really hard to think clearly 
and yeah. behave correctly despite being emotional, which is very different from being, you know, driven by her emotions. And yes, she does kind of lash out at Jess, but I think from our perspective in her head, I think he kind of deserves it. Yeah, so. no, I, I think you should make it right. <laughs> I love this quote in particular, though. Let's get married, he said in a sudden strong voice. He had the air of a man who has decided the best way to solve the Gordian knot problem would be to hack down through the middle of it, full speed ahead, and get the whiners below decks. That's just wonderful writing. I, I love that so much. And it like I think King is really good at cluing you in on the essential nature of these characters. And I think... It, when I read that sentence, I I understood Jess in a way I hadn't up until that point. And mm -hmm. I, it, it's just wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So Franny kind of demands that Jess pick another option, that that is not an option that she wants. She does not want to marry him. She doesn't love him. Um, and so she's like, that's not an option. Pick a different one. And Jess refuses to. And the tension kind of escalates and escalates and escalates until – uh, he slaps her across the face. So if if we had any sympathy for Jess remaining, it gone at that point, right? Like he's taken it to violence. He's slapped her and you're just like, okay, fuck this guy forever. I'm done. I hope yeah. you die of a super flu or something. Well, that's what's funny is now that King has given us one specific character to just hate, um, <laughs> now King is totally going to make him be one of the tiny sliver of, of a percent of survivors yeah. who somehow makes it through the entire book being a, being a piece of, a piece of shit the whole way. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because it, throughout the, you know the rest of these chapters we're going to have characters who we don't particularly like or who are kind of primed to not like in in you know Franny's mother um in in perhaps Larry's mother in other ways but the the text always like takes the time to like explain to us maybe why these people became this way, why they, they became hardened or why they behave the way they do. It's not really interested in doing that with Jess at all. Right. It's just like, he just, he's kind of like just this aloof college kid who is, is very convinced that he's a poet and, uh, and is just continually like behaving in the wrong way in all these situations. Yeah. It just seems like a, a, a calculating and selfish person who has yeah. learned how to present himself to be acceptable. Yeah. I, I I love the way like, man, Franny is so strong. Like he immediately apologizes for slapping her. Right. And her response here is accepted. She said colorlessly drive on. It's just like, man, I love her. I love her so much. She's just like, great. I accept your apology. Moving on. I don't want anything to do with you anymore mm. later. Yeah, it's awesome. And then I need to read this section here. Some of my favorite writing in this chapter and in the book so far. She sat with her hands folded in her lap, watching the slices of ocean layered between the cottages just west of the seawall. They look like slum apartments, she thought. Who owned these houses? Most of them still shuttered blindly against the summer that would, would begin officially in less than a week. Professors from MIT, Boston doctors, New York lawyers. These houses weren't the real biggies, the coast elites owned by men who counted their fortune as seven and eight figures. But when the families who owned them moved in here, the lowest IQ on Shore Road would be Gus, the parking attendant. The kids would have 10 speeds, like Jess's. They would have bored expressions, and they would go with their parents to have lobster dinners and to attend the Ongonquit Playhouse. They would idle up and down the main street, masquerading after soft summer twilight as street people. She kept looking out at the lovely flashes of cobalt between the crammed together houses, aware that the vision was blurring with a new film of tears, the little white cloud that cried. Holy shit, man. <laughs> ah, Jesus, Stephen. Amazing. <laughs> it's just incredible, right? Like just this, this moment where Franny is looking out and thinking about her life and thinking about what it means. And, and this, this perfect picturesque definition of what it's like to live in this town what it's like to live in a town where you have these people that she relates to jess right come in that that don't really belong here that don't live here that that pretend and that's jess's right like i love the moment where the kids would have 10 speeds like jess's king is wanting us to connect this man to these people that she's thinking about here yeah yeah I, it's it's really cool i i want to this is one of those um times where I might go back and reread the entire part that we, you know, covered this week because some of this stuff is so good and I want to give it, you know, give it more of a chance to breathe and sink in. Yeah. Um, I really love this. Yeah. 
So chapter three begins with Norm Bruett, which is one of the Arnett folks drinking a beer at Haps when Campion show up. Norm is one of those uh, wonderful Stephen King characters who just like exists to be in a, a complete asshole. He's racist. He's sexist. He's a shitty husband. He's a shitty father. He's just basically an all around shitty person. Uh-huh. Um, I, I love this, though, Matt, because the only point narratively of these three to four pages are to show Norm. At one of the patients, people, you know, first in contact with patient zero is now sick. It's to demonstrate that the virus is passing. We could have just said that, right? We could have just whipped by him, but instead we live with him in the shitty, miserable, no good life for a few pages while also mentioning that he feels like he's got a hangover. Then there's a tickle in his throat that keeps hocking up Fledgem, right? I just, it, it's, it's so unnecessary to define this total jackass, but we do. And I love it. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I mean, these are some of my, my favorite King characters are, are the ones who are awful um, because it's funny because it, it's it's like he's almost cartoonishly awful, but also yeah. no. Also, we know that people like this absolutely exist. Um, they often don't make it into novels, which is part of why it feels maybe a little cartoonish is it, it's it's like people like this are rarely considered to be the subject matter of, of the uh, esteemed literary form of the novel. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, I think, I think people like this are indeed exactly who King wants to write novels about. Yeah. He, he he wants to explore the, this side of us, you know, and I, I was trying to think like, what are we, what exactly are we saying with, with his inclusion? I mean, he, he, he is going to die. Um, and everybody in his family is going to die. Are we supposed to feel a kind of nihilism about this or a kind of justice about this or a kind of like, what are we supposed to feel about this exactly? And I don't, I don't even have an answer or, or even a suggestion of an answer because I, I don't know if I understand where, like, like the thrust of the book yet, but, um, I guess I'm just going to keep that question in mind as we, as we move through. Yeah, sure. I mean, I could I could pose an answer for you right now, but I think it's it's better to just keep that and, and keep going. OK. Uh, so from here, we cut over to Hap's garage where the world's dumbest state patrolman comes by to tell Bill that the government health department folks are on their way. And if he wants to avoid them, he better get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. This we'll see not only manages to infect patrol man uh, aptly named Joe Bob, uh, in which he'll then go on to infect uh, 20, 30 other people on his own. Um, it also makes the rest of them so much harder to round up all in all in the the good pretenses of just just helping out. Thanks, Joe Bob. See, now this is some accurate writing about what a <laughs> pandemic would be like. You got people helping each other by helping evade quarantine restrictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's the authority figures themselves who are spearheading the charge toward breaking the, the restrictions. Yeah. It's Bravo. Great. So prescient. <laughs> Our chapter ends with the Hodges family. Um, as Norm's wife looks after them, we see that they're all sick now too. And I, I, I felt this part particularly charged to me. Lila, who is not afraid of the cr- croup after seeing both of, both of her own through bouts with it, picked her up by the heels and swatted her firmly on the back. She had no idea if Dr. Spock recommended this sort of treatment or not because she had never read him. It worked nicely on baby Cheryl. She emitted a froggy croak and suddenly spat an amazing wad of yellow phlegm onto the floor. <laughs> so tactile and gross. It's, uh, yeah, that's like we were saying earlier. It it really emphasizes the, uh, just the, uh, I, I keep saying visceral, but like it's it, it triggers a reaction in your body is what I mean. Like where, where you're like, like kind of want to swallow, you know, mm-hmm. it's awful. Yeah. Yep, it is awful, especially like we see here that like a lot of, you know, flus, it, it seems to be affecting the children quicker and worse than, than everyone else. Right. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is scary <laughs> as parents. Uh, that's a good point. I hadn't consciously noticed that, but you're totally right. That is happening in in the book. 
All right, so we move on to chapter four, in which we meet General Starkey, a West Point graduate, multiple medal winning badass who is in charge of the rapidly unfolding situation at the uh, facility holding what we learn is Project Blue, the Captain Trips virus. Um, We learn here, Matt, that he's absolutely fucking terrified and popping pills aggressively just to maintain himself. And uh, and so that's really comforting, right? That's really comforting. Yeah, that's that's great. That's really good to see that we have uh, the uh, the best of the best of the best mm-hmm. um, in charge of the whole situation. Yep. And he chops the whole thing up to just a goof, right? You see, there was a goof. Somebody made a mistake with a box. Somebody else forgot to pull a switch that would have sealed off the base. The lag was only 40 some seconds, but it was enough. Just a goof, Matt. Just a, just a couple yeah. of goofs. Yeah, it was a bad call, Ripley. Yeah. Um, the the use of the word goof there, I think, is just absolutely intentional <laughs> and perfect, right? Like, it's just uh-huh. ju- just a goof, just a little goof. Yeah. It's going to end the fucking world. Oopsie. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're not only that, but then the next the next sentence, somebody made a mistake with a box, which mm-hmm. is such a it's like a child's way of it's like you're explaining it to a child, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you quoted Burke, but it is absolutely that kind of that kind of reasoning like i made i made a call and it was a bad it was a bad call i shouldn't have opened the box it was a bad call yeah it's like okay that doesn't help actually burke (laughs) it's good to see that you're sort of taking responsibility but it's too late for that now yeah yeah so we learn here that Project Blue, a.k.a. Captain Trips, has a 99.4% infection and lethality rate. We also learn that it mutates, so the body does not have time to develop an antibody to defeat it. And in short, everyone's fucked, right? That's the the kind of takeaway from this pretty short chapter with General Starkey. Um, everyone's fucked. There's mm-hmm. no stopping it. And Starkey is kind of just popping pills while obsessively watching the 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 footage of the cafeteria project blue which is filled with all the dead corpses of all the scientists and and people working down there um and we see he calls a general staff meeting to i guess announce that everyone's fucked (laughs) yeah yeah um i mean i guess one takeaway from this is just like the the they are not really on top of this at all um yeah they are so far from being on top of this that that it's comical and uh uh it's almost like what what is even the point of finding out what they're doing if what they're doing amounts to basically nothing and they're they're so far behind the eight ball i guess this is this is the first time we learn that it's got a 99.4 infection and lethality rate right which is yeah correct which is not really like a number that is completely meaningful but it doesn't matter the point is like less than one percent of people in the world are gonna be left after the virus is over um so that's I guess that's one reason why it's valuable to, you know, get this insight into what the uh, the brass are thinking about things. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because we do have this later chapter that um, chapter eight, which kind of just explains in, in a lot in great detail exactly how the virus spreads. Right. We just kind of go from character to character to explain how the virus spreads. Um, and, and so we don't necessarily need this chapter but it does provide some important context i think like we get to see you know this virus was made in a lab that's Mm. confirmed um it is extremely lethal that's confirmed and so we kind of move forward into the next events of the story with a very clear understanding of just exactly how bad it is um that that i mean you know it's very once again it's very easy to go into this book knowing that this is a pandemic post-apocalypse story right but you can't write it assuming everyone (laughs) knows that so we have to kind of check some of the boxes and this is very much a check the box scene where we get we get this key information about the the virus itself and also the way it's written conveys a lot about the the story's attitude toward authority Um, yes yes that you know you have this guy who is um popping pills in order to deal with the uh anxiety caused by the consequences of his own actions as and and then you know continuing to be in charge despite being the guy who you know made the fuck up in the first place yeah um so so it's 
yes, I agree. Like in a sense, not story crucial in another sense, important to conveying all sorts of information at multiple levels of narrative. Yeah, totally. Totally. So we move from here on to chapter five, um, where we'll meet another one of our, our main characters here. We meet Larry Underwood. And I think by now you're probably noticing a pattern, right? We, we kind of are slowly and steadily advancing the super flu plot as it spreads. But in between that, we're having like our chapters introducing our cast of characters. So we've had Franny now, and, and this, is, this is going to be the Larry chapter. So what do you think generally about how this structure is working? So... I mean, it's funny because very often this sort of structure does not work very well for me anyway, because you don't, uh, you'll be going through a story and you'll be switching between characters rapidly at the beginning of the story and you're annoyed because you don't want to move away from that character you were just with, you were into (laughs) that. Now you're with a new character you're not necessarily vibing with, you're constantly annoyed. This happens to me with a lot of books, especially especially epic books where toward the beginning of the book, you're meeting like 17 new characters. I'm just like, oh, my God, I, I actually hate this. And then eventually those characters grow on me, but it takes like half a book, which strikes me as a failure. Sure. But this is Stephen King. So you're excited. <laughs> you're loving each of the characters as you meet them. And then you're excited about who you're going to meet next. And, uh, you know, as it is, I'm just really like happy that we're establishing this stable of brilliantly fleshed out and distinct characters and i'm just really excited to see where we go with each of them um yeah man i'm so excited like i i have been enjoying season two and we've read a lot of really good books but like this book is reminding me of what it felt like like the first time you met eddie and i was like partially jealous that you get to turn a page and like meet eddie dean for the very first time that's how i'm feeling as we go through these characters like oh my god matt's reading he's meeting franny right now he's meeting larry right now this is so this is so cool and exciting and this Mm. is this is what happens when when your your friends are reading books that you truly truly love yeah right that's the that's the whole joy of of the premise behind this podcast right yeah (laughs) Yeah. so fun to watch somebody discover this stuff where you just know they're gonna love it Mm -hmm. mm-hmm mm-hmm so like if the predominant image of Franny's intro chapter here is is a, is a woman uh, uh, biting her tongue until it bleeds in this picturesque image of the eastern seaboard, then the, the predominant image of Larry's chapter is what we open up to here, which is a dead cat corpse sitting in an alley in New York City as a rat methodically tears away at it. Um, it's a great symbol of Larry Underwood, ladies and gentlemen. It certainly is a symbol, yeah. <laughs> um, earlier I was going to ask, what is the ca- calculator factory a symbol for? That feels very symbolic. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah we, we keep returning to the <laughs> to the rat eating the cat. Um, right, right. And, and, and that's, you know, I think I could hazard some guesses about what that's a symbol of, but um, maybe, maybe we'll just move on and, and that'll come up again. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the the thing that's worth pointing out, though, is is the way that Stephen does con- like constantly return to this. Like, it's a symbol for us, the reader. But I think the way it works is it's also kind of a symbol for Larry himself. Mm-hmm. That like we learn very quickly that he's kind of returned home after a very very long time away, and he's embarrassed and and hurting and like trying to collect himself and figure himself out and he sees this as like a a great failure on his part and and the image that is is completely uh, surrounding those feelings is this this rat chewing on a dead cat's corpse Mm -hmm. i think it's it's just very very fitting sure i mean i i i agree i mean within if you sort of take his chapter as a short story yes it it absolutely works in that way i i was going to zoom out and say it is a kind of perversion of the natural order you think of you think of rats as being hunted and eaten by cats. And, yeah. And so the, the rat eating the cat is, is a, a flip of the natural order. It, it's a sort of, the sort of, um, scare, scary, um, thing that I was like, that sh- shouldn't happen that way. Um, it's, it's unnatural and it, it maybe is a, you know, an omen of, of uh, presaging the, the greater, uh, interruption to the order of things. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. I mean, in a book where the 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 top of the food chain is about to be totally mm-hmm. laid low, I think that's that's very very apt imagery there. Right. I love that. Well, and then also it's going to be the survivors are going to be the rats, right? The survivors are going to be the scavengers. Sure, um, sure. Which I think all of our characters are about to become like the rats, basically. Yeah, no, I like that. 
So as we said, Larry is home in New York for the first time ever to visit his mama. But before we deal with that very complex, wonderful scene, we have to learn a little bit more about our character, Larry. Yeah, I, I think it's actually a bit of a structure break because we it, it, King loves his his brief interludes of of backstory, but this is a downright interstitial short story about uh, Larry's Larry's recent past. Right? It, it's a yeah. Uh, we, we spend quite a bit of time flashing back to to uh, Larry's adventures in the music business. That's true. That is very true. Um, I, I think it's because it's so important to who he is at the beginning of this book. We have to spend the time seeing what led him here. Mm -hmm. so larry underwood of of baby can you dig your man fame which do you finally understand uh baby can you dig your sam's uh name one of our frequent discussion question answers it's great yes i love it uh we learn here that that his fame is new that as short as 18 months ago he was just you know a, a struggling musician trying to get gigs um and his life since then has been kind of a whirlwind in the way rock and rollers lives are you know you you cut a single it suddenly breaks f- out there for for reasons that not everyone fully understands and becomes incredibly popular and that's exactly what happened to baby can you dig your man and it's just kind of catapulted him forward into this lifestyle that he wasn't quite ready for and i think one of the things that's really worth noting here is the, the racial notes behind a lot of what's happening here. Larry is white, but we are told again and again and again, you know, by particularly racist characters uh, like Norm in the last chapter or, or, or Larry's mother her, herself here in this chapter, um, that when he sings, it sounds like a black person singing, that people hear him on the radio and think he sounds black. And we will learn a, a little bit later, like Gary kind of admits indirectly to maybe throwing his voice a bit to, to feed into that. I don't know. And I just find that really interesting in this, this, this character of Larry who kind of struck it big very quickly. Um, we keep hitting this beat and I think I'm very specifically paying attention to this because I did just see the, the Baz Luhrmann Elvis movie a, a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And of course, Elvis Presley is a, a performer who, you know, very well known for taking a lot of music that was very popular in, in, african-american spaces and bringing it to the masses in a way that was palatable specifically because he was white in the 1950s and that's just the way things were unfortunately back then and so i just I, that's been on my mind a lot and i'm wondering if we're doing you know a similar thing with larry underwood here possibly i mean it seems like it for sure i, I know that this is kind of a an area of interest of of Stephen King. He he writes about yeah. about these sorts of race issues quite often, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I don't know where we're going with this, or this is going to continue to be relevant in any sense, or if it's just kind of a one off mention of um this dynamic existing within within uh, music. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we could maybe say here at the beginning is that part of Larry's problem is he doesn't have a really good sense of self-identity. He does Mm -hmm. not necessarily know who he is. He's just kind of a person that just goes with it, whatever it happens to be. Um, And maybe that's part of it is that he's kind of actively in the way he's performing and the way he's heard by people uh, as being not really the person that he is. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, he allows himself to take on whatever guys suits him because he doesn't have his own voice. Uh, actually, yeah. that's that's a that's perfect. He ha- he hasn't found his own voice, yeah. and so he uses other people's voices. That's mm-hmm. that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think there is something that stuck out to me though here because you know we learn in this whirlwind like he cuts an album and but we, one thing the one part where larry puts his foot down is the name of the album right so Mm -hmm. the album cover was a photo of larry in an old-fashioned clawfoot tub full of suds written on the tiles above him in columbia's secretary's lipstick were the words pocket savior and larry underwood columbia had wanted to call the album baby can you dig your man but larry absolutely balked and they had finally settled for a contains the hit single sticker on the shrink wrap So like this is the one place in Larry's entire story that we see him put his foot down, right? He doesn't want to call the album the name of the hit single. He has a name for it, Pocket Savior. And that's, I mean, that's, I mean, we have to pay attention to that, right? Because again, it's the one moment where Larry says, no, this is what I want, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the connotations of, of 
a sa- savior um yeah you know yeah. In, in a in a pandemic situation is is interesting but um, pocket savior it's uh, that's so fascinating yeah it's interesting because it's um my first thought was you know you got a little jesus in your pocket it's a it, it's a, a a savior you carry around with you mm-hmm. um that has its own connotations and then i was for some reason thinking about like billiards and like the idea of like the pocket being the target i i, I think that's less um there's less there there but um i was just exploring possible meanings yeah no i like that i don't th- i don't know if we know larry well enough yet to really understand what would prompt him to call his album pocket savior quite yet yeah but i i just wanted to point it out because it, it is you know one of those rare moments for larry i like how i was imagining this to be a a, uh, a vinyl record this entire time even though this is 1990 <laughs> and it was probably a cd well, you know why you were you were imagining it to be vinyl record because when King originally wrote this, so was he probably. Yeah, and yeah. I think it just has just enough ambiguity to it where you could just be like, "Oh yeah, it's probably just a CD." Yeah, I don't know when did CDs really was nineteen is nineteen ninety two early for CDs? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. That's it. Probably would have been a cassette tape, to be honest with you. I mean, I, th- I think within. Oh yeah, you're right. It would have been a cassette tape. That's like I know, I know point. CDs like uh, the '80s. Like there were CDs, but I feel like they didn't become a cheap enough. Like CD players didn't become cheap enough to be like popular at home things until maybe after. And I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say this because I'm not sure 100. percent But so Walkman, the 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 the. Okay, that's not what I asked for. <laughs> the Walkman with the cassette tape came out in 1979 but i wanted to look walk cd walkman isn't there a cd walkman is that a thing yeah this i mean i think they came out later but the disc i mean i very specifically remember having a, a cassette tape player like a, a walkman cassette tape player and so i'm judging the entire world by my experiences which means if i was old enough to remember this i was probably seven which means it was 1992 and i did not have a cd player until i was much older this is so confusing, man. Well, I'm sure you could buy a CD version of Baby Could You Dig Your Man according probably, to this. Yeah. According probably. to this version of the book anyway. But there definitely would have been a cassette version as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we see here that Larry hits a big and the parasites descend upon him. And Larry kind of eats it all up, right? He kind of is, is loving this. Like, I, I, I think at this point, maybe it's worth pointing out that like this book doesn't have a super favorable optimistic viewpoint on humanity right like the the people larry surrounds him with self are leeches larry himself gets big-headed pretty extremely fast and and embraces all the worst instincts of of rock and roll famedom you know you mix that in with with franny's former beau being kind of a jackass himself and then you got the government and you got all these kind of side characters it's like humanity man (laughs) not not great so so this actually calcifies a certain theme for me so so like like you were saying you know we're just muddling along we're all kind of dumb we're we're kind of all the authors of our own destruction but i think what this sharpens is it's not just that we're the authors of our own destruction it's that even and maybe especially when we receive an amazing windfall of good fortune we can always be relied upon to totally squander it and probably end up worse off than we started yeah and, you know, you can view like the 20th century as being an amazing windfall of good fortune for the United States, sure. which, which we systematically just just punched in the nose and, and, <laughs> and held its head underwater until until it died. Um, and that's that, like at least I feel I, I think due to this book and other things that I have seen from King, that is his feeling about america and his own generation specifically is like yeah is like wow we were we were so lucky and look what we did with it nothing you know um yeah. and in this book it's like look what we had and then we used all of that wealth and knowledge to make a pandemic that killed everyone yeah and i think i mean i agree with you but i think the look what we had and look what we did to it goes beyond just the pandemic itself i think there's a lot of kind of subtext uh, in the undercurrent of this book about how th- bad things are going generally like mm-hmm. even before captain trips he makes yes, his appearance i agree um but but i think i think it's important to say here right that the like 
not all the people in this world are bad, right? Like th- this book has a, a, a pretty pessimistic view of humanity generally, but there are good people that exist in this world. And I think we get to see one of those good people here because we have one of Larry's, you know, quote unquote friends, Wayne, who in this moment where he's rented this big house and is like throwing this forever party because of the success of his album, takes him aside and offers him some advice. He's like, you're spending more money than you're making. You're not rich and famous yet. These people are just going to keep leeching off of you. Get out of here. Get out of the situation. Get yourself centered. And you could have a long career. And and this, this guy, you know, doesn't like Larry mm-hmm. <laughs> particularly, but he sees someone that needs help and he he's he's helping him, right? Um yeah. I, I I think this is really important actually to what we're doing here. Yeah, I mean, I, I especially love how Wayne is genuinely like, I don't really care that much about you. You're you're kind of a fuck up, um, but I'm going to do the right thing here and give you a little reality check. And then I'm just going to move on with my life. And yeah. um, it's something about like doing your duty and being a stand up person. And uh, Wayne comes out, out of this looking really, you know, admirable. Even if we never see him again, it's still kind of a, yeah. a, a moment that you can imagine Larry thinking back on. Yeah, um, it's it's so good because, you know, I, I think it's really important. One of the things we the re, kind of one of the reasons Larry listens to him is that Wayne, we learn, is kind of rich on his own. And so he doesn't need Larry for money or anything. And so, like, I don't I, I keep going back to this because it's on my mind lately because I just saw that that Elvis Presley <laughs> movie. But um, one of the things that that movie explores is the idea that, like, you as a, as a rich person kind of surround yourself with friends and family um, that are supposed to help you and help you make wise decisions and help you do the thing that's best for you. But also you create a situation in which all these friends and family are dependent on you for their survival. Like Elvis's father was his manager for a long time, his business manager. And so like they are influenced by their desire for financial stability and comfort and safety to not do the thing that's best for you, you know, emotionally, but do the thing that's best for you monetarily, AKA best for them monetarily. And I just, once again, I, I think there's a lot, I, I think intentionally there's a lot of Elvis in Larry Underwood is what I'm saying. I think King is kind of exploring the, 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 the rock and roll character um, that, that, you know, Elvis is one of the most well-known versions of um, with, with how people, just kind of completely take advantage of you if you let them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's fun, you know, it's a fun, it's a fun subject matter, matter yeah. to, to read about a guy totally. who's, who's uh, driving his life into the ditch and, and you're like, yeah. no, come on, man. And like, you can kind of <laughs> see his potential and you kind of, you kind of like him a little bit, even though he's a fuck up. So yeah. uh, you want to see him turn it around. I think you're totally right. Um, I think, yeah, that, that's a good point because there is a version of Larry Underwood who you just totally hate. And it, it's not like you love him from the beginning. He like, like we said, he gets pretty big headed pretty fast. He's kind of a jerk to people. Um, he thinks he's really hot shit. Uh, he's a rock and roller in a lot of ways. Right. And, but there is, there is a part of him that just endears yourself to him. And I think it's very important that we meet him at the end of this particular story first, before we see the whirlwind rock and roll stuff. I think like we see him as a defeated man who's, who's, come back to New York with his tail between his legs before we learn his full past. And so we see him as the kind of loser who fucked it all up before we grow to like resent the way he reacted to all this stuff. I think that's really important because, because the book does not want you to hate Larry. This is a special skill of Kings that I, I can only ever hope to somewhat understand is his ability to like sequence things where, he can introduce you to a person who is sort of objectively a bad person, but by posing them in a certain way and and showing you them, you know, when they're down, you have a ton of empathy for them. Mm-hmm. Or he can choose not to do that, and then you just think they're a piece of shit. Um, yeah, and and yeah, he knows definitely. exactly what he's doing in in either case. Yeah. So Larry wakes up from uh, this kind of dream slash memory he's been having of of the past few months to see his mom tapping on the glass of his car, waking him up. And oh boy, it, it, this is one of the most complicated relationships we've had in the, in the story so far, Matt. I, I love the way King frames this scene 
with her, you know, catching him sleeping and waking him up. And, and Larry immediately connects this to the way she woke him up when he was 10 years old, um, where she, she would kind of sneak into his room and like tap him to wake him up when he was sleeping too long. And it does this thing where it frames the relationship, or at least from Larry's perspective, as child parent, not as two adults, as mommy and baby boy. And I think that's really important to to th- the nature of what this relationship is. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. It's um, it's a beautiful um, passage. I mean, it's it's like you said a second ago. It's complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, it it it's there's so much it, there's so much dynamic history between them. Yeah. Um, and and we're only seeing I think the tip of the iceberg, but it's so well drawn that I think we can infer a lot of what is under the surface. Yeah, like, listen to this. She turned back to him and he hugged her. For a moment, an expression of fright crossed her features, as if she expected to be mugged rather than hugged. Then it passed and she accepted his embrace and gave back her own. The smell of her sachet slipped up his nose, evoking unexpected nostalgia, fierce, sweet, and bitter. For a moment, he thought he was going to cry and was smugly sure that she would. It was a touching moment. Over her sloped right shoulder, he could see the dead cat lying half in and half out of the garbage can. When she pulled away, her eyes were dry. <laughs> I love that, man. Like mm-hmm. her, every bit of it, like her her initial gut reaction to recoil to his his request for a hug, to his absolutely convinced that this is going to be such a powerful moment that she would cry and she doesn't at all. The once again, the look back at the dead cat and this this warm moment he's trying to create here Mm -hmm. it's just so rich and dense and i just love it so much this is this is sort of a a simplification of what's going on here but but i I, what's fun to me is that uh larry doesn't realize that his mom has like had a whole life since he last saw her he just still thinks of her as his mom the the unchangeable constant north star Mm -hmm. and it's obvious to us seeing through his eyes that Alice has had has you know we we don't know exactly we don't know what what Alice has been up to but we we kind of feel like she's seen some shit and and Larry is sort of oblivious to this and I love how this can be conveyed to us despite the fact that Larry our point of view character is is oblivious to it yeah no I, I think you're totally right because it like we are seeing the version of Alice that Larry sees right like th- this this kind of hard woman who you know, maybe wasn't the best mother to him. Maybe it was kind of, kind of cruel to him. Um, and, and you know, her life kind of made her this way. She's obviously a very prejudiced woman. She, like she was seemingly angry all the time. We see that version of her, but yeah, we, if around the edges of that, we also see a woman who has, you know, lived a life and, and like, she doesn't, she's not good at expressing herself, but she's trying a lot. Yeah. Um, I, she's a wonderful Wonderful, fascinating mm-hmm. character. I love Alice Underwood so much. You know, she kind of makes me think about Liz Garfield like 20 years later. Oh, man, I love that. I love that so much. Because she's not really much like the Liz Garfield that we know from Hearts and Atlantis. But, yeah. But maybe the older Liz Garfield when Bobby Garfield comes back home to her as an adult, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anyway. I think it's really important to, to the, the same line of, of talk we're having here. At the end of the chapter, we do this really fascinating thing that the book really hasn't done up until this point. For most of this chapter, we've been firmly in the head of Larry Underwood. We've been in his point of view. And then at the very end of the chapter, we suddenly shift to Alice's point of view as she's like looking on and looking at her crying son. Um, and and she looks at him and she sees this, you know, it's almost a, it's almost like she's see, looking at her crying son and she sees the hardness to him, which is which is interesting because, you know, he's in this moment of vulnerability. But all she can see is is the hardness at the core of him. And and she kind of defines him for us in a way that only a mother could understand their kid. Right. And I just I love I love this writing here. He would go along not thinking, getting people, including himself, into jams. And when the jams got bad enough, he would call upon that hard streak to extricate himself. As for the others, he would leave them to sink or swim on their own. Rock was tough, and there was toughness in his character, but he still used it destructively. She could see it in his eyes, read it in every line of his posture, even in the way he bobbed his cancer stick to make the little rings in the air. 
He had never sharpened that hard piece of him into a blade to cut people with, and that was something. But when he needed it, he was still calling on it as a child did, as a bludgeon to beat his way out of traps he had dug for himself. She also thought there was a good in Larry, great good. It was there, but this late on it would take nothing short of a catastrophe to bring it out. There was no catastrophe here, only her weeping son. I mean, that's incredible writing. That's like that's incredible characterization. Like that's just wonderful. Yeah, yeah, right. We we love a character who's down on his luck, but who has promise, and the book Mm -hmm. is basically Mm -hmm. said, Hey, that's who this guy is. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And it would take Um, nothing short of a catastrophe. Luckily, we've got one of those on the way. Uh huh. He reminds me a little bit of, of Eddie right before Roland finds him, where yeah. we yeah. see that there is deep steel in him, but it has been totally wasted and, in fact, put to ill use. Um, yeah. Put put to use uh, digging himself traps that he has to escape from. Um. So so yeah, love this guy. Love this character. Mm-hmm. And and this is one of the places where I think that the motif of change really starts to to show up here, especially as we move into the next chapter. But like, what what Alice Underwood says of her son is that he is a person that has not changed, that he is the same as he was when he was a kid, that she has changed. She has changed and she was hoping that he would, but he hasn't. And she's worried that he's too old now to change fundamentally, that that he's past the point in, in a man's life where, you know, they can kind of define who they are. Mm. And I, I like I love this idea of like he's the hardness in him. He's not sharpened it because he's not cruel, but he's still using it like as uh, as a bludgeon to beat his way out of traps he had dug for himself. How wonderful is that? How wonderful of an image is that of defining who this person is? A guy it. who gets himself into trouble and is strong enough to get himself out, but he will he will rip apart everything around him to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. Um, do we know exactly how old he is? Because I kind of. I don't know if the text told us, but uh, it might have. I think he's pretty young, I think. Uh, but I I'll, I'll look that up and we'll get back to you next week. Yeah, because I guess I kind of pegged him as being like 25 to 30, but I wouldn't be surprised to learn he was younger than that. Um, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, I guess we'll mm-hmm. probably find out later. Yeah, um, I tried to look it up real quick while you were talking and it did not. It did not come to me easily. So yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, uh, I, I agree with your, your feeling that he is, you know, um, young, mm-hmm. y- young on the young side, but not like super, super young. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. So we move from here over to chapter six, where we cut from this heartbreaking version of parental love between Larry and his mother to another complex, fascinating parental relationship, Franny and her father. And I think the juxtaposition here is intentional, right? We move from this one, uh, parent-child relationship to another parent-child relationship that's i mean you think that's intentional right yeah and and i think even the in, the contrast is intentional we had we had father daughter or we had mother son now we have father daughter yeah um these are two and they're two very different dynamics in all sorts of ways um, mm-hmm. yeah yeah so so we learn here that that franny is clearly a daddy's girl right like it, we we see almost immediately just how much love and respect she has for her father here and i think you know part of part of jess's failings perhaps are that he was not even remotely close to the type of man this guy is that's a good way of putting it yeah because because he's awesome like this guy mm-hmm. yeah. he's, he's such a he's such a he's, he's one of the most clearly unambiguously just like good dad figures we've ever seen because i think king he loves his his complicated contentious parent child relationships particularly yeah. mother son but he's also had some bad dads in there mm-hmm. um or some ambiguous dads but <laughs> he just seems like a, a really good guy so. yeah definitely um he's he's a, a very you know like down to earth you know, blue collar worker guy. Um, we meet him here tending very carefully to his garden. I, I love this beat about him being distrustful of authority. Like he's a, he's a good old, uh, rare main Democrat, but he's still like entirely untrusting of the government, which mm-hmm. fits very well into the book right here. Like I love this quote, put not your trust in the princes of this world for they will frig thee up and so shalt their governments even until the end of the earth, <laughs> which is just, a hundo percent right there, Peter. You were right on the money. Yeah. No, it, it, again, yeah, fits perfectly in this book <laughs> in particular. Yeah. 
Uh, but the thing we do see about this relationship, though, is that, that he and Franny don't necessarily have a complex relationship, but the complex relationship comes from his wife, from Franny's mother. The, uh, the, 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 we get the feeling that Franny and her mom have a much more contested relationship, even though we've yet to see that play out. Um, one, one thing worth noting here, I want to hit this beat again, is that Peter says that his wife is too old to change, that she's she's too old, she's not going to change, which is you know something similar – was said last chapter about Larry. Larry's mother thought the same thing about him, that he's, he's, he's past the age where, where change is possible. Um, this is obviously a motif here, right? I, I'm curious what you, what your thoughts of it here after these two instances are. I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the book is inviting us to sort of wait and see, right? Because I, I suspect a lot of people are indeed too old to change until something catastrophic dislodges them from their comfortable sure. position. Sure. Um, you know, I, I can think, you know, just just speaking of mundane things, like a lot of people kind of seem really set in their ways and like they're going to be that way forever. And then they have a kid and then they definitely change. Right. Sure. Um, that's just that, that's one of the more sort of normal examples of things that can happen to a person. But it's very dramatic, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's worth kind of considering, you know, what what is necessary for real change? And like, is is there ever a situation where you are so <laughs> in rutted i guess that only only big huge events like this would cause change you know is is the book saying that like uh, speaking broadly that that society our country you know is is so set in its ways that the only way to kind of shake it out of that is something as big and destructive as this thing that's about to happen uh yes i think the book is saying that (laughs) all right all right Uh, So Franny tells her father that she's pregnant and he reacts in the perfect Peter Goldsmith way, which is that he's he's worried for her, um, but he's not going to blame her or blame anyone else. There's no blame here. Um, And he's just just a wonderful, wonderful dad. But uh, I want to talk to you about this this quote here. Your mother will have plenty to say about blame, he said, and I won't stop her, but I won't be with her. Do you understand that? She nodded. Her father had never tried to oppose her mother anymore. Not out loud. There was that acid tongue of hers. When she was opposed, it sometimes got out of control, he had told Franny once. And when it was out of control, she just might take a notion to cut anyone with it and think of sorry too late to do the wounded much good. Franny had an idea that her father might have faced a choice many years ago. Continue opposing opposition resulting in a divorce or surrender. He had chosen the latter, but on his own terms. I kind of... I hate like I I hate this. I love Peter Goldsmith. Uh-huh. But I hate that this is what he's chosen for himself. That he's like going to sit here I think he's he's in love with his wife still, definitely. But I feel like he's not helping repair the relationship between the two of them by kind of setting himself outside of it and mm-hmm. being like, "No, I'm not going to say I disagree with her, but just so you know, I disagree with her. It's like, okay, you win points for that, I guess. But if you're not acting upon that, you're not actually doing anything for me. I don't know. Like, I, I, just, I feel like this is really messed up. And I feel like as a father, he like has a responsibility to not like play this game between her and her mother. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it is a kind of abdication of responsibility to, yeah, to yeah. or another, another maybe meaner way of phrasing it is that he has just been beaten down he has been broken down to the point where he's just going to keep his mouth shut and let his wife run roughshod in in a lot of important ways, right? Like yeah. this is an important issue. And he has committed himself to just kind of let it happen uh, because, to be honest, it's not worth the hassle. And that's um, – I, th- I, I kind of think of that as being a bit cowardly. And, and I get that humans are complicated and that you have to make sacrifices sometimes but um as great as as we were saying he is earlier like i think he i think he is a great father but he is flawed he is yeah. um sure. you know it's it, it's interesting maybe maybe he's even a little bit weak you know I, I, yeah cuz cuz you know i think weakness versus strength is something that we are exploring here and the idea that he's going to he's going to give his daughter this pep talk and then his wife's going to show up and he's going to let his wife just drag her over the coals and say nothing. It's like, well, that's kind of weak. Yeah, it is. And he feels okay about it because he kind of 
discussed it with her on the side and she, and he's comfort comfortable to know that he has her back, but not really. Um, mm-hmm. it, yeah, it's just a little, it's a little upsetting. Um, yeah, I guess we'll see where we go with this character. Sure. Sure. Um, Franny tells her dad that she can't marry Jess. Speaking of weakness, she says he's weak and they're just not compatible. I love this little anecdote she tells of the one time they went to a poetry reading and she got the giggles during this poetry reading and just couldn't stop laughing. She thought it was funny and he got so pissed off about it. And 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 she describes this as like a a, a something that will live with them that if they get married that this you know the, the captain giggles <laughs> will will come to her and will live with them and he will over time grow to resent it and so she will button it up to make him happy and just be unhappy herself and i think this is remarkably mature of her to look at the situation and recognize this essential truth of their relationship you know at yeah. 22 years old right. in, in a situation where everything around her is telling her just be with him and it'll make everything easier um it's, yeah. it's incredibly mature and wonderful i i god i love franny and it's especially drawn in contrast to what we just talked about this idea that her dad had to bury this big part of himself in context of his marriage which is obviously a huge part of his life and yeah. she and she's thinking to herself like well you know if, if i were to be with jess it would be a similar thing for me i would have to basically surrender and, and lose this part of myself and it would be totally. a compromise. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe people can decide that the compromise is worth it and maybe it is worth it. I don't know. I don't, I don't know everyone's circumstances, but yeah. I think the way the book is casting it, um, it would be a, it would be kind of a tragedy for that to happen. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I also think, you know, like I said a second ago, the book is, is exploring weakness and strength and hardness and so forth. And I think, calling Jess weak so close to the conversation we just had with Larry and his mom, it specifically contrasts Larry's mom calling out Larry's hardness. Je- Jess lacks that gunslinger quality, that that hardness that can be used for good or for evil. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it seems almost, I don't know if the book is saying this, but it almost seems like just having that quality is better than not having it, even if you're going to use it for ill. Um, because weakness is is even more destructive than misused hardness. Interesting, um, yeah. Or at least it could it could potentially be because you yeah, no. you know a weak a weak person makes a perfect member of a, of a lynch mob, right? Yeah. A person with hardness, they might you know they, they might lead a lynch mob, but they're not going to get swept up into one. Sure. <laughs> and that is better, right? Leading <laughs> one, that's better. At least you're leading, right? It, it, you know, at least you'll only be in a lynch mob that you think is. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just let that go there. I really wanted to see you like, contort yourself to make that work. Um, I mean, no, I, it, it's yeah. I mean, it's sort of a ridiculous position, but I, I, I do think that people who are who are weak are more dangerous in some sense. Yeah, and and, and I, I think you're absolutely onto something here. By the way, I, I think this is really important to what the book is doing. I think you're picking up on it perfectly, and I total, I completely agree with you. I do want to say that we get to learn a little bit more about Franny's mother as well here, right? Like this is a character we're kind of being primed to not like. And then we have her father kind of explain why Carla maybe became this way. It seems to me that Carla stopped growing after Freddie died. She slapped three coats of lacquer and one of quick dry cement on her way of looking at things and called it good. Now she's like a guard in a museum, and if she sees anyone tampering with the ideas on display there, she gives them a lot of look out below. Um, so the, the, another kind of fascinating beat here of resistance to change mm. and, and, and a conscious resistance to change that she, you know, a, a horrible, tragic event happened to her. Her, her son died. Mm-hmm. I can't I can't imagine what that would do to a person. And her response to that was to, uh, you know, stop, to mm-hmm. just stop and just halt her life and and be this person. And I think, you know, we, we basically we're told from Peter that, you know, Freddie was Carla's favorite. Franny is like, we, they each got one. Right. But we don't really see Peter talk honestly about what the death of his son did to him because I'm sure it did something too. So maybe his, his decision to kind of, you know, curl up and relent and, and let his wife, you know, kind of rule the roost was maybe partially his reaction to losing a child sure yeah no that that's a great point i mean it's important to i i, I kind of went hard at him for a minute there um but i i agree it's important to think about 
all of the complicated factors that go into a person's life that add up yeah. to them making a decision like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to call out the the fact that their children were named Freddie and Franny. And number one, how confusing that would be. And then also just like it, it's kind of it's kind of an adorable thing to do. And I guess that almost makes it more tragic that Freddie is dead. Yeah, definitely. So we see here for a moment that Franny considers abortion um, and asks her father kind of his opinion on that, which, you know, I, I feel like this opinion that that Peter Goldsmith here would, would we would find right at home in Stephen King's insomnia, right? Peter is opposed to abortion here, not for any kind of high fluting moral reason, but because whenever he thinks about abortion, he thinks of his son, Freddie, who died. Um, I, I love the text here. I just see Fred. He was destroyed inside. There was no chance for him. These right to life biddies hold up their pictures of babies drowned in salt and arms and legs scraped out onto a steel table. So what? The end of a life is never pretty. I just see Fred lying in that bed for seven days. Everything that was ruined pasted over with bandages. Life is cheap. Abortion makes it cheaper. You know, obviously, Matt, we're kind of in the middle of a uh, a moment again where abortion has, you know, taken center stage in our national conversation, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court. And it's, it's a rather sensitive topic here. But I, I want to say that, like, I think Peter's opinion here matches you know what stephen king talked about in insomnia but also i think matters like the, in my opinion the the right idea right he is personally opposed to abortion for his own very specific and personal reasons but what does he do here does he tell franny you shouldn't do it does he tell franny you cannot do it you should not be allowed to do it no he says like you asked my opinion here's how i feel about it now you ultimately have to make the decision for yourself. Um, and we see here that Franny does that, right? She says, I don't want to for my own reasons. And that's the way, that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, this is very much in keeping with insomnia. Um, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's got their own complicated, deeply held feelings and, and their own set of experiences guiding those feelings and, yeah. um, yeah. concept kind of just lands differently with everybody. And, and that that's, yeah. um, What's interesting is Stephen King obviously has his own specific personal views on this, but yeah, those aren't necessarily wonder, the views that he puts in his books. It's, it's, I, I, yeah, I, <laughs> God, I wonder about that, right? Like, like how, like, is Peter Goldsmith echoing King here, or is this just he's made up yeah. the the opinions of someone who is generally anti-abortion? And like, I don't know. Like, King is obviously a very you know outspoken liberal progressive person. I think. You just have to look at his tweets since the Roe v. Wade reversal to see what his current feelings are on pro-choice. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, he's very for it. Um, but I, I don't know. I think this is complicated, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean, I would guess that that this character probably is pretty close to him. But also, I, I think when it comes to his fiction, he's very consistently tried to maintain kind of the integrity of the fictional world. Like, he has sure. this idea that he's... He, he isn't writing the story. He isn't creating the story. He is discovering the story like a sculptor chiseling away at a piece of rock to reveal the sculpture that was hidden inside all along. And he has a tremendous amount of integrity when he does that because I don't, I don't really think you can see his politics in any of his books, even the one that's about abortion. Um, <laughs> and I think that's pretty remarkable. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it is filled with politics, but I think, you know, he writes characters of all stripes and sizes. Yes. For sure. the, the, re rephrase what I said. There is politics in his book, but it, his books are not just, this is what I think about things. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah. All right. So we move on to chapter seven in which we leave Franny and her father behind for now and head over to Vic Palfrey, one of the Haps Texaco crew who we learn now is now deathly ill and strapped to a bed inside at Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Center for Disease, Disease Control. Vic is having fever dreams about his own mother's death, which I think really cements one of the big ideas floating around this book of the concept of parents and children, right? Like this feels to me like a thing we're doing a lot with parents, kids, you know, like even, even Stu um, is a character we learn, you know, who, who wife passed away due to specifically um, uh, uh, uterine cancer uterine cancer thank you so you know that's again 
there they're not kids there there was a there was a thing a thing growing inside her that is the opposite of what it was supposed to be right this, mm-hmm. this, so i don't know i feel like again and again and again we're we're doing this thing with with children and parents and you know these relationships seem to be very important to the book yeah i i agree i mean um yeah it's, it's awesome good point yeah so vic we learn is basically screwed matt um but there's one member of the hap texaco party who isn't because our our old friend Stu redman still hasn't gotten sick and the book makes it very clear that the government is very interested in knowing why they're they're kind of obsessively studying him and taking his blood but they're not telling him anything and that's that's frustrating our old boy yeah um it's interesting it's it's uh, uh I, I i think you know also they probably don't know you know they, they don't know why he's not getting sick it's obvious yeah. why they'd be interested in him right mm-hmm. um, they haven't said the word immunity and immune yet right but but it seems like that's the place that's where we're going yeah there's just going to be some people who are immune some some tiny fraction um mm-hmm. and it, i i guess it remains to be seen how kind of sciencey we're going to get with this I, I would i would kind of expect not very uh, cause I don't think it matters that much, but yeah, yeah, we're just going to have some fraction of people who, and, and I think it's worth pointing that out because it's like there, uh, you know, the, the other book we read recently, I think most of the survivors were just people who had been very, very isolated mm-hmm. and then the pandemic burned its way through everyone and it basically killed everyone who it contacted. And then once it was over, um, that there were, there were no people left carrying it anymore. And so if you survive that first, you know, spreading phase, then, then you were fine. That was the vibe I got anyway. This is going to be different. This is going to be, there are people who, who just seem to not catch it. So, yeah. 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 Um, I guess one of the things I, I wanted to talk to you briefly about is this idea that we see here that, that you see in stories a lot whenever there's this kind of, you know, you know disease or, or big event, you see the government knows way more than the citizens, especially those who are exposed to the thing and just refuses to answer any questions. No one's answering Stu's questions. We see kind of the whole scene play out where everyone from the, that, that has come in contact with someone that was co- in contact with Campion is kind of carted onto a plane and shipped to Atlanta and they're not telling them anything and it just causes panic and confusion. Um, I, and I mean, what, like, obviously I don't want to ask, is this something that would really happen? Because I think the last couple of years have proven that probably, yes, it would. But I mean, does this just tie into our, the general, you know, motif of the book is like the government is frustrating and cannot be trusted. Um, sure. I mean, I, I definitely agree. And, and yeah, like, like the, the government can be relied on to cover, its own ass as this mm-hmm. kind of um hydra of um of uh unaccountability right where it's it's like you you, you can uh, you can count on you can count on the government you can count on any individual in the government to defer responsibility to somebody either working for them or above them in the chain of command <laughs> and and the net result is it is a totally unaccountable organization especially in an emergency where sure um yeah and and that's that is indeed what we saw and i and it, it just so happens that the book horrifyingly lines up with what we actually saw yeah yeah um <laughs> just do you think there's a good there's a good ac- a reason to not tell Stu what's happening like is there a good legitimate reason for for withholding that kind of information um no i mean there's like an ass covering reason which is like yeah. which is like if we get this all locked down and he turns out to be you know we 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 stop the we stop the spread um and we get this locked down and he's one and he's like a survivor we don't want him to know that there was a secret government program to develop a virus we don't want him we, we want him to know as little as possible for our own selfish interests uh, you know in, in like a national security capacity you could say sure. so i mean yeah if we're, if we're allowed to use buzzwords like national security interest then i guess you could say like yeah i guess but like you can use that to justify practically anything really. So yeah, can and, and will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you this on this. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. Like you just want to be like, it might actually help if Stu just knew some of the details of what was going on. Like you don't have to be like, yeah, we totally developed this thing in a lab. Um, mm-hmm. 
but you can just be like, yeah, there's a there's an outbreak. We're working on it. Um, you haven't gotten it yet, and we're just trying to figure out why that is. Exactly. You know, maybe that would make him more susceptible to helping out. I don't know. It yeah. just that's not the way we're going. Yeah, I don't want to map this too much on the current events, but like that was the frustrating thing was just the 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 authority not not being not being willing to just speak to the people with respect and candor and clarity and, and it, was, it was always like managing us mm-hmm. as a as a population yeah and that didn't work like that backfire that led to distrust and skepticism um yeah because people I, don't like being managed i agree I, I think it's this careful balance of like you as an authority figure you're very worried about admitting that you don't know something right so you try to avoid saying i just don't know the answer to that question and i understand the desire to want to do that because you want to provide comfort to people and just saying i don't know isn't very comforting but also i think you're right that people are very smart and can tell when they're being managed Mm. and like i could tell your real answer is you didn't know but you can't say that and right. so you just obfuscated and and pushed around and i think that's exactly what's happening here as well yes. they don't want to they don't want to tell Stu that they just have no fucking handle on anything that's happening here so instead they choose to just tell him nothing exactly and that's awful i yeah. like that yeah I, I love more of what we see of Stu here right because he's kind of been told nothing but he's reasoned quite a bit himself right we see that he's kind of figured most of it out already campion was infected with something he passed it on to everyone he came in contact with and so they rounded them all up and brought them here to try to study and or save them and also he himself for whatever reason hasn't gotten sick yet and they're interested in that he reasons all of this out himself and so once again we are kind of left to be impressed by Stu's um uh, smartness and and competence i think yeah, yeah, not just smart, but also level head, le- le- level headed, practical, fearless, just you know, very kind of, very admirable how he has handled everything up to this point. Um, you know, it's it's funny that the book just offhandedly said he was in the war with like no other detail. It's like okay, yeah, yeah. like in what capacity? <laughs> like, yeah, no, he, he was seems, there. Seems like a badass. I also love this moment where Stu, out of frustration, is just like, is just like yeah you be careful you don't want to rip your suit it looks pretty weak and then like makes a playful grab at the, <laughs> the representative suit and he like f- fucking loses his mind uh-huh. and then the speaker of the intercom like it admits this this noise and uh-huh. like and like he sees that there was a stir behind the double glass that everyone freaked the fuck out when he did that <laughs> and this is again how Stu is like putting things together right because like he knows there's something going on he knows they're wearing these suits and now he knows that they are like incredibly afraid Mm -hmm. of being exposed and and so he knows oh wait this is super super serious yeah no it's i mean it's a funny moment but also it's clever of him yeah yeah it's it's funny how like this is the end of the world we're watching the end of the world play out slowly beat by beat here and it is surprising how funny this book is at times i think king really navigates those tones really really well yeah i agree All right, so we move on to our second to last chapter of the week, chapter eight. This one will be really quick, Matt, because this is an extremely short few page chapter that I don't want to go into too much detail about because I think the 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 genius here is in just how it it plays out for us. And I don't want to like I feel like talking about it too much ruins it a bit. But basically, King just allows us to follow the course of Captain trips from its origin point as as it continues to spread and spread and spread and we do you know the king characterization thing right where each one of these people on the chain are real people are real people that are going through their real lives and then they catch death and unknowingly spread it and it just carries on and it, it it it's one thing to like say and then the virus spread and spread it's another to like show it and I love how King shows it here. I love, you know, we we meet up with a family going on a, a road trip. Although, Matt, I have to say, question for you. Mm. Guy from New York City mm-hmm. going to Walt Disney World. Mm-hmm. Why is he in t- Texas? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, well, it, it, I mean, I. so does it specifically say he's in Texas or has the virus already spread so far that that – he catches it on the way south along he the coast. He comes in contact with the state patrolman that mm. helped out Hap. Okay. Um, 
And then later in Oklahoma, he passes it to someone else. So, well, the- I don't know. You folks, maybe some of you don't live in the United States, but open up a map. <laughs> Look at Orlando, Florida. Look at New York City, New York. <laughs> and tell me why they went to Texas. I mean, maybe they were living somewhere other than New York or, or start. I, I, the only plausible explanation is they were not starting from New York City. Um, they were well, starting they're, from they're the coming West. back. So they, they're actually coming from Orlando. So they're. Okay, that makes even less sense. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they just wanted to go on a tour of the U.S. And so they said, we're heading back to New York. Let's take the scenic route through Texas, uh-huh. which is very far away from Orlando. Yeah, that's, um, um, you know, uh, maybe in uh, on this earth, Texas is on the <laughs> East Coast. Anyway, that's minor quibble aside. I just love how all this plays out. You know, you have the the two women that go out and get drunk and then go to a pool and you just like it just carries on and carries on and carries on. Um, yeah, I think the one that that particularly messed with me is the little baby Hector, whose symptoms keep getting worse and worse and worse. Like I, I definitely put my son in that position, right? Yeah. Where you're like this this kind of very understand understandable thing of like, oh, he's sick. Oh, he'll be fine though. It's just a cold. Oh, it's getting worse. And like the slow build up to, oh wait, no, this is serious. Like you don't immediately go to the worst possible thing right away. Right. Yeah. Right. I I agree. I could definitely empathize with the anxiety of the parents and, you know, um, there's also, there's, there's always this balance when your kid is sick where you're like, you, you want to just be like, it's probably just a cold, right? But then they get kind yeah. of a high fever and you're like, oh, okay, well, have to take it seriously. And then it's it's a little bit worrying and it's like, you never know, like, well, what is the right level of worried to be, right? That That's a question yeah. that has no objective answer. Um, and, you know, anyway, yeah, I, I could, I could put myself in their position and it's, uh, yeah. It's I don't want to call, I don't want to call the doctor because yeah. I don't want the doctor being annoyed with me for calling all the time. But I don't know if if I should be worried or not, you know? Yeah. It's yeah, it's that constant push and pull. Yeah, that's I mean, it's it is. I agree with you. It's interesting how much the book is actually focused on small children, because I feel like in the other I'm, I'm not you know remembering super clearly, but I'm, I'm thinking about any other, you know, virus literature I've read has really been focused on like adults doing adult things trying to solve problems being very kind of proactive and Mm -hmm. and 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 then maybe adults catching the virus and dying but this is spending a lot more time on small children and uh which is part of which is like the reality of how it would actually go you know yeah um that was like the only the 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 only thing that was um you know i don't know i don't want to say good but it it, it was the fact that covid didn't seem to hurt kids was like a massive kind of load off because otherwise i would be a total basket case right now to be honest yeah i think you're right that like most of these stories would be like you know say 99 percent of the population dies out that obviously includes 99 percent of babies and children right. right but most books would look away from that a little bit or or you know just know that it's that it's assumed that when there's only one percent of people left on this earth it meant a lot of babies died horribly but this book and Stephen King in general just doesn't want to shy away from that stuff. He wants to shine a light on the most horrifying ideas possible. And so he shows it again and again and again. And yeah, it's awful. Exactly. But, uh, mm-hmm. True. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I love, I love this writing here. Chain letters don't work. It's a known fact. The million dollars or so you are promised. If you, you'll send one single dollar to the name at the top of the list, add yours at the bottom and then send the letter to five friends never arrives. This one, the captain trips chain letter worked very well. The pyramid was indeed being built, not from the bottom up or from the tip down said tip being a deceased army security guard named Charles Campion and the chickens were coming home to roost. Remember chain letters? I I do, yes. These were pre-email chain letters he's talking about here, too. <laughs> now there are chain text messages. That is, oh my God, I get so many spam text messages. It's driving yeah. me crazy. No, it's great. I, I think one of the most powerful moments of the chapter, though, is its last few words, right? Where we've just spent the past three or four pages like showing the virus spread and spread and spread. And then the chapter ends with, and so on. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a statement, right? Like, it's just like, boom. I just, I read that and I was just like, oh, fuck, man. That's the perfect way to end the chapter. Yeah. 
I agree. I mean, there's there's definitely a lot of horror to this idea that that it basically spreads to everyone who you contact, mm -hmm. and yeah. so you can just just going about your day, you're just infecting everyone everywhere yeah. you go, and then they're infecting everyone. Everyone, it, it's yeah, that that's it's very yeah. it's very heavy. Yeah. All right, Matt, we are finally at our last chapter of the week, chapter nine, in which we get to meet another new character. This time it's Nick Andros, who is a mute deaf man who, as far as we know, he says he's not a vagabond, but he just kind of wanders around, uh, you know, just kind of wandering, doesn't have a home, just wandering yeah. around. He's not a vagabond. He's just he's just he's just doing some vagabonding. He's just doing some vagabond. Yeah. Um we meet Nick, Nick, though, much like our, our other characters, in the middle of a big problem. Of course, Nick's big problem is is a little bit more, uh, you know, immediate in that we meet him currently getting his ass beat by a bunch of asshole townies, um, which I mean, we don't actually learn here, like why they're doing this. Just that he saw them at a bar. They followed him when he left the bar and just proceeded to beat the shit out of him. There's a lot that we don't know here yeah it, it we it's it's almost an in media res like crash into the story moment and we're left pretty disoriented actually with respect to this character and where he's coming from and, and who he is yeah i mean it's interesting to note that we don't actually know nick is deaf and mute until well into the chapter until he starts having a conversation with the sheriff we have this whole intro part play out where we're pretty sure we're in nick's point of view but we are quote unquote, hearing people talk during it. And we know some of this hearing is him reading lips, but not all of it, right? There there are definite moments in here where it's literally audible noise happening that Nick cannot hear. So we're at least partially removed from Nick's point of view throughout this chapter. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I didn't think of that. I, I, I think it, it, it does seem to be a looser third person because mm -hmm. sometimes, like, so for example, we hear... We, we are privy to everything that Sheriff John says, even though Nick's back is turned or, or, or his Sheriff's back is turned to Nick. Yeah. Yeah. His back is turned to Nick. So, yeah, it's it's um it's a bit of a detached third person. Yeah. Which is a, a little bit different from the other ones. Right. I mean, with the exception of like we kind of left Larry's point of view to, to follow his mom briefly, but we were pretty close. I mean, I think Franny, we were you know very close with. We're kind of seeing her thought process play out real time. Something that we're not really seeing of Nick. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, Nick wakes up in a prison cell. His wounds obviously have been tended to by a doctor, and it's here he meets Sheriff John Baker, the law, in these here parts. And here we get to know Nick a little bit better. But I'm curious here, like, what are your thoughts on Nick? I think yeah. at the end of this chapter, we know him the least out of any of the main characters we've met. Sure. We're shown much, much less of his interiority. We really know mm -hmm. very little about him. Yeah. Uh, most King characters, they catch us up with, you know, a, a deluge of story and, and their past and their perceptions of things and their feelings about things. And and Nick, um, we don't get that. Nick is is cagey, not only cagey with the sheriff, but kind of with himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think part of this might be a, an effect of the limited third person. But also, I think that this is an intentional choice by King. He doesn't want us to know who this guy is yet. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, you know, we learned like we don't know. Speaking of, you know, parents and children, like where where's his family? Right. Mm -hmm. Like what wh what is his connection to this world? Why is he wandering around? Why is he live this life? He's a person that, you know, cannot hear and cannot talk, but is kind of chosen perhaps or, or had chosen for him. We don't know the full story to live alone in isolation, wandering around. You know, it seems like a very difficult life for anyone, let alone a person who can't hear or, or speak. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of mystery around Nick. You're totally right. And, you know, we kind of answered a lot of the mystery of, of Franny and especially of Larry kind of right away of, of who they are and how they got to where they were. But the fact that King holds this back on Nick is really interesting. Yeah. I, um, I'm excited to see where we're going. It's a very different kind of an introduction to a Stephen King character in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't to say, though, that he's not characterized, right? Like we don't learn his backstory, but we do get a little bit of character here. I, I really love this moment where Nick is kind of identifying the man who beat him up and it just happens to be the sheriff's brother in law, which <laughs> we just got to love small town America, right? Everyone's related to someone. And so the sheriff is like, oh, man. 
this is going to suck. Um, the sheriff kind of tries to talk Nick out of it. He says it's probably not worth trying to pursue because at the end of the day, it's going to be your word versus theirs. And because, you know, you can't speak um, and you're an outer towner, your word is not going to be taken as seriously. And I think this is kind of the Nick defining moment, right? Because we have this moment. Nick thought about it. In his mind, he kept coming back to the image of himself being shoved from one of them to the next like a bleeding scarecrow and to raise lips forming the words, I'm going to mess him up. Sucker kicked me. To the feel of his knapsack, the old friend of the last two wandering years being ripped from his back. On the memo pad, he wrote and underlined two words. Let's try. So this is, I mean, I think defining who he is, right? He's kind of told, you know, this might be the right thing to do. It might be justice to get to punish these people for what they did, but it's not really worth your time. Mm -hmm. And he decides it's important enough to him. He's been wronged and he wants to see these men brought to justice, even if it doesn't end up working. Yeah. Um, so we know a little bit about him now. Yeah. He, he is going to pursue justice. I think that's um something I wanted to mention at some point today is, Hey, isn't the stand an interesting name for a pandemic story? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty obvious what the stand means. It's some there's going to be some kind of stand. <laughs> it's going to or or people or the idea of of people taking a stand against something for something. What is the stand? Who's taking the stand? Mm -hmm. And and the idea of 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 characters who are who are in pursuit of justice. You know, despite the fact that there's horrible things happening around them. Um, that to me ties in the idea of, of taking a stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I like that. Um, and we will, we will find out more about Nick in the coming weeks, but that is going to do it for us this week. As the chapter ends, poor old Sheriff Baker sneezes a little bit. Um, he's got a little bit of that summer cold there, Matt. Um, and I think this is important, right? As we leave the reading for the week, because I think, you know, we've kind of been jumping around a lot between characters and besides Stu, who, of course, was, you know, immediately involved in this whole thing, all of our other characters have mostly existed in a world outside of Captain Trips, right? Mm -hmm. Franny the, 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 is up in Maine. Uh, it has not reached there yet. Um, Larry is in New York City. It has not reached New York City yet. So the, the, the virus itself exists completely tangential to the things that are going on with these two characters. This is the first entrance instance with Nick that what's going on with Nick and what's happening with Nick and the virus are kind of being brought into direct conflict with each other as we, we kind of gesture towards here at the end of this chapter. So that seems like a important shift in, in our storytelling here. Yeah, I agree. We're moving into the, kind of the next part. I think that yeah. makes it a good stopping point. Actually. I'm, yeah. I'm only somewhat furious with you for making me do this. <laughs> Well, guess what, Matt? We're almost done. And then you can go read more because you've got another 11 chapters to read next week. Oh. We're going to be reading chapters 10 through 20 next week. Awesome. So happy. Yeah. All right. So that is going to do it for the chapter discussion. A long one this week. You know, we didn't even have a discussion question and still went for over two hours, which shows you, I think, how excited we are to talk about this book. Indeed. All right. And we have a discussion question for you all. Uh, for those that may be new to the show every week, we have a, just a, a fun topic to get discussion moving about uh, something to do with something that happened in this week's reading. Matt, what is the discussion question for next week? What would you do if Captain Trips were real? <laughs> Let's just say right now that you can't just answer I would die because that's boring. Um, uh -huh. We saw <laughs> we saw a lot of what people uh, are doing in this week's reading you know how they were reacting to it what would you do would you you know just dig a hole and, and hide in it hoping that it passes you by what uh, would you do what would you do i'd, I'd find the, the sandy beach i'd dig myself a hole <laughs> bury myself and stay there for two weeks that's my just plan. two weeks yep. and then it'd be, it'd be fine after that then i'd come out all right and then i'd be totally fine all right well that's matt's answer what about the rest of y'all let us know what would you do if captain trips were real all right, and that is going to do it for us here this week. As we said, next week, The Stand will continue with part two of 15 as we talk about chapters 10 through 20. Matt, it's only going to get better. I'm so excited. I'm so happy we're talking about this book. 
Uh, it's it's a good times. Good times here at Kingslingers. It's good to hear. So remember, you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And uh, for those of you not in the know, uh, you can answer that discussion question any of those places or you can head on over to our subreddit at uh, reddit.com slash r slash doof media. Uh, there will always be a discussion thread for the episode and that is a great place to uh, to give your answers to the, to the discussion question. And of course, you can just uh, peruse the subreddit in general. Yeah, and chat and share pictures. Someone shared a incredibly awesome Dark Tower tattoo the other day. Mm-hmm. That was really great to see. So yeah. it's a fun place. Come hang out. But make sure you are also subscribed to Kingslingers because you would miss an episode and, and you that would be sad. So just don't don't do that. No. Subscribe. There's plenty of places to subscribe. Basically, anywhere podcasts can be found, you can click that subscribe button and it will automatically send the new episode every Thursday morning to your podcatcher and you'll be like, hooray, I'm happy. That's right. And if, <laughs> and if you like any of our shows on the Doof Media Podcast Network, uh, including this one, obviously, and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks this week to new patrons Ross C. and Mark R. Welcome to the community. We hope you enjoy the cool benefits we have for the patrons. So much bonus content, so many things. Check it out, patreon.com slash doofmedia. But if you can't afford to donate, that is absolutely okay. You can always help it out, help us out by sharing this podcast. We're on a new book. We're covering The Stand. There's a chance, there's a very good chance, constant listeners, that some people out there who love The Stand, have never listened to our podcast before. And this is your moment to convert them to our cult. So share this podcast. Tell people we're doing an in-depth 15-part episode covering The Stand and that you can be a part of it if you just press that play button. So please do that. Please, please. Yes, please. And please keep leaving us those ratings and reviews. This week's spotlight review comes from See These Canines, who gives us five stars and says, Kingslingers is my tower. I only just discovered this podcast a month ago and have blown through the first six Dark Tower books and have started on the finale. Every time they said, please remember to rate and review, I replied, oh, I definitely will. And promptly forgot as soon as I got home. I have forgotten the face of my father. I cry your pardon, Kingslingers. Obsessed with this amazing podcast, I look forward to reaching the tower and beyond with you guys, and I've already started some other doof pods because of it. Well, that is wonderful to hear on every single level. Um, obviously, you finally you finally remembered the face of your father and clicked that review button. So thank you so much, See These Canines. That was very nice of you. Thank you for listening, and thanks for trying out other stuff. We got a, a bunch of other podcasts that we think are pretty good. And you should check them out. Yeah, yeah. There's no need for you to go west. The the the, the podcast reception out west is terrible anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to everyone who keeps sending those in. Uh, they really do help, honestly. Uh, the the algorithms love ratings and reviews, so please keep doing them. All right, that is going to do it for us on this incredibly long episode. I hope they're not, Matt. We gotta we gotta find a way to to. We got a lot of stand left to cover. They can't all be two and a half hours long. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, the beginnings of books are always this way. Yeah, I wish that were true. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you all enjoy it. So uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right back here next week on part two of The Stand. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs> <laughs>